Good morning, and welcome to the New York City hybrid hearing with the Committee on Public Housing, jointly with the Committee on Contracts. At this time, please silent all electronic devices to vibrate or silent mode. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. That's testimony at council.nyc.gov. Chair, be ready. Good morning, this meeting is coming to order. Um, good morning everyone and welcome to this joint hearing of the Committee on Public Housing and the Committee on Contracts. I am Council Member Alex Aviles and I am the Chair of the Committee on Public Housing. I would like to thank my colleague, Council Member Juan, the Chair of Contracts Committee for holding this joint hearing with me today. I'd also like to acknowledge my colleagues on the Public Housing Committee who have joined us today. Chio Se, Council Member Chio Se, Council Member Barron, but along with other Council Members, Council Member Ariola, see, Council Member Rivera, uh, oh, and Council Member Gennaro, Council Member Ressler, who is online with us today. Thank you for joining. The aim of today's hearing is the same as it always is for the Committee on Public Housing to increase transparency and accountability at NYCHA. We are looking for greater insight into NYCHA's procurement and hiring practices. Without that transparency, we as a city council cannot properly hold NYCHA to account when things go awry. I'd like to acknowledge some of the steps that NYCHA has taken towards these goals. As of last year, all of NYCHA's income and budget data were integrated into Checkbook, an important tool for ensuring the public has a look into how the city raises revenue and allocates its spending. Additionally, NYCHA now has a dedicated chief procurement officer who is here today uh, to, count, to testify before the council today. These are important changes NYCHA has made since the committee last held a joint hearing, but it doesn't mean all the problems are solved and we still have a lot of questions to be answered. There have been reports of contracts being awarded to vendors who do shoddy work and yet somehow the same vendors are again selected to receive contracts from NYCHA. Last year, several NYCHA contractors were arrested in a bribery scheme related to micro-purchases, which don't require competitive bidding. And in the past, NYCHA has failed to obtain bids from qualified contractors in a timely fashion. Additionally, the latest quarterly report from the HUD-appointed Federal Monitor shows that capital projects for heating, elevators, waste management are increasingly delayed. While these delays can't be solely attributed to NYCHA, we should be taking a very hard look at all of the factors at play because ultimately, the people who pay the price for these inefficiencies are the residents themselves. Today, I would like to shed light on NYCHA's contracting and procurement policies and procedures, particularly as they differ from the city's ordinary procurement processes, policies. I want to hear more about how vendors are selected when NYCHA elects to hire third-party vendors instead of completing work internally, whether NYCHA saves money by contracting out, and how NYCHA oversees and assesses contractors. I would like an update on NYCHA's compliance with Section 3 and NWBE hiring goals. And I want clear answers as to how exactly NYCHA holds contractors accountable when they fail to deliver. With that, I would like to turn it over to Chair Juan for her opening remarks. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you so much, Chair Aviles. My name is Julie Wan, and I have the privilege of chairing the city's contract uh, committee of contracts. We are holding today's hearing in large part to discuss the details of NYCHA's procurement policy, how it operates, where it differs from mayoral, mayoral agency procurements, and critically, where there are opportunities for improvement in the face of fraud, corruption, and mismanagement. While the city's contracting processes are far from perfect, they nonetheless offer several safeguards and redundancies to protect the misuse of taxpayer funds. State law requires most large awards go to the lowest responsible bidder. Rigorous responsibility determinations need to be, made, to be conducted on each city vendor, and in addition to the contracting agency, the Mayor's Office of Contract Services, City Comptroller, and Department of Investigations all have a role to play. 
These layers of transparency create accountability for city agencies and ensure that city funding achieves the goal of preserving public funds and ensuring the appropriate use. NYCHA's procurements, on the other hand, are largely regulated by the Department of Housing and Urban Development. A federal agency with significantly less restrictions with regard to competitive bidding, which can result in more opportunities for waste. The goal of this hearing is to figure out ways to ensure that NYCHA residents are, are able to live in safe and habitable apartments without broken lighting, leaky roofs, and poor heating, or no heating at all. NYCHA predominantly contracts for repair and maintenance work, construction and electrical supplies, and other goods and services that impact its 335 housing developments that are home to 525,000 New Yorkers. But NYCHA is notoriously underfunded, which is probably why ongoing intercom issues have continued to plague, plague properties like Queensbridge houses in my district, or like the repeated delays in repairing heat and hot water problems at the Woodside houses, both of which are in my district. While we commend NYCHA's recent efforts to integrate its contracts into the Comptroller's Checkbook NYC website, and to adopt similar rules as the city regarding contracting with minority and women-owned businesses, more remains to be done to ensure NYCHA's contracts go to bidders who are capable of performing the work. NYCHA's procurement policy manual is a good start, but weeding out bad actors is just as important. When NYCHA officials engage in bribery schemes, contractors don't receive appropriate trainings that result in repeated workplace accidents or major capital repairs go unfinished, it undermines our entire public housing system. We hope this hearing provides us with an opportunity to, com to compare NYCHA's procurement rules to those at mayoral agencies and to figure out ways to make NYCHA a more effective and transparent partner for many of our city's most vulnerable residents. Before we begin, I would like to thank Contracts Committee staff, Senior Counsel Alex Polinoff and Policy Analyst Alex Yavalon for all their hard work on this hearing. I'll now turn it over to Committee Counsel to swear in the administration. Thank you. I will now administer the oath to the administration, which is uh, represented today from NYCHA by Sergio Paneke, Sean Mavani, Shauna Castillo, Eva Trimble, and Carrie Ju, and from Mox, Anne Meredith, and Kim Yu. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing before the truth before these committees, and to respond honestly to council member questions? Thank you. You may begin when ready. Thank you. Chairs Alexa Vilas and Julie Wan, members of the Committees on Public Housing and Contracts, other distinguished members of the City Council, NYCHA residents, and members of the public, good morning. I am Sergio Paneke, NYCHA's Chief Procurement Officer, and alongside me are Eva Trimble, Chief Operating Officer, Sean Mavani, Chief, Procur Chief Asset and Capital Management Officer, Shanna Castillo, Senior Director of the Office of Resident Economic Empowerment and Sustainability. And I am also joined by my colleagues at the Mayor's Office of Contract Services, Chief of Staff Kim Yu, and General Counsel Ann Meredith. I've been provided the opportunity to present to you an overview of NYCHA's procurement. I, am joined, I joined NYCHA in November of 2020 with the charge to re-engineer the Supply Management and Procurement Department and introduce best practices as part of NYCHA's transformation plan. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss the progress we have made regarding NYCHA's contracting and hiring processes. My first order of business upon joining NYCHA was to conduct an agency assessment of NYCHA's procurement operations through the lens of the NYCHA's transformation plan to identify immediate issues that needed to be addressed to meet residents' needs. NYCHA's transformation plan, which is on our website, calls for a redesign of the procurement, inventory, and vendor management processes to improve performance. We engaged outside experts to assist us in conducting a procurement assessment and analysis of our current policies and processes, which resulted in the development of a strategic plan for implementing key recommendations. NYCHA's new procurement strategic plan establishes our values and maps out specific goals, objectives, and activities to transform the procurement function in a way that fulfills our mission to meet NYCHA's needs. Our core values are focus on customer service, 
start with the resident, foster a culture of empowerment, procure as one NYCHA, use data to plan and evaluate, and lastly, enhance NYCHA's appeal as a partner. Our strategic plan goals are to transform procurement and purchasing structure, improve procurement and contract management processes, expand staff capabilities, broaden and improve NYCHA's vendor pool, implement enabling technology, and source proc procurements strategically. With the roadmap in place, the next step was to memorialize those values and goals in a new procurement policy for NYCHA. At that time, NYCHA was using a procurement policy document that had not been revised for many years. We looked at other public authorities' procurement policies for best practices and developed the first comprehensive revision, resulting in the procurement policy manual, the PPM. Examples of significant additions to the PPM include the use of pre-qualified lists as provided in the Code of Federal Regulations and incorporation of the design-build procurement method pursuant to the design-build legislation enacted by the state legislature in 2019. The PPM took effect on January 1st of 2021 and streamlined the consolidated policies into a single centralized source. The PPM has since been revised twice, the latest version of which was approved by the NYCHA board in April of 2022. We continue to evaluate policies and look for opportunities to revise and improve to meet the authority's needs. The governing statutes for NYCHA's procurements are set forth in the Code of Federal Regulations at 2 CFR 200 and in sections 151 and 151A of the State Public Housing Law. Both the CFR and the PHL are prescriptive and provide an overarching framework for how procurements need to be conducted. And in most instances, they are complementary to each other. However, we do find that the sealed bid requirements applicable to the acquisition of commodities and DACAR, contract services for demolition, excavation, construction, alteration, and renovation in the PHL 151 is rather restrictive, is not current with procurement best practices. NYCHA continues to seek legislative changes that would mitigate these issues, challenges, and allow for best value procurement of goods and in construction services that take into account total cost of ownership, as well as qualifications and value-based selection to improve the value realized from our contracting dollars. Please note that neither the sections of Article 5A of the General Municipal Law addressing procurement by certain governmental entities in New York State nor certain relevant provisions of the New York City Charter and Procurement Policy Board rules apply to NYCHA. Therefore, there are considerable differences between statutory and regulatory frameworks governing NYCHA and the city with respect to procurement. Now I will discuss the restructure of the Supply Management and Procurement Department. We undertook, undertook a comprehensive reorganization starting in April of 2021, and the department is now organized into four service verticals. Procurement, Purchasing Logistics and Inventory, purchase Procurement Policy and Performance Management, and four, Procurement Ethics and Vendor Responsibility. Mm -hmm. The Procurement Department is now organized according to the types of goods and services being procured, capital and construction, services and information technology, and goods. Staff are being trained to be end-to-end -end buyers, and we have also consolidated support functions into a centralized administrative group. The Purchasing Logistics and Inventory Department combines the previous Materials Management Group with a newly formed Purchasing Group, which is staffed by dedicated buyers who support NYCHA in each borough to align more clo closely with NYCHA's neighborhood model and help provide timely assistance and bridge any gaps between the developments in the central office. This team provides last mile support, so to speak, for delivering goods and services to the developments. The Procurement Policy and Performance Management Department leads the overall expansion and development of NYCHA's diversity initiatives, namely minority and women-owned business enterprises and Section 3 requirements. It is also responsible for strategic sourcing capabilities, establishing and implementing procurement data and management policies, and working closely with IT to improve integration of procurement-related technologies. We are focusing now on improving planning and forecasting tools as part of our contract management initiative in order to build out a strong spend analysis and strategic sourcing capacity. 
Lastly, the Procurement Ethics and Vendor Responsibility Department is responsible for advising and training on procurement ethics, both to internal NYCHA employees as well as the vendor community. This department is also responsible for ensuring NYCHA is contracting with responsible vendors. The goal of this restructure are to support the strategic procurement transformation efforts to deliver greater value, customer service, visibility, efficiency, accountability, and more diverse vendor participation. In addition to the organizational improvements mentioned above, the Supply Management and Procurement Department also launched a formal MWBE goals program. Previously, NYCHA's MWBE program was aspirational, and the shift to the current goals program mirrors the city's endeavors and reflects NYCHA's commitment to diversity initiatives. We also strengthen our Section 3 activities, including developing a Section 3 and MWBE first policy for micro and small procurements, identifying categories of spend under the neighborhood model as an element of strategic sourcing, and focusing and localized Section 3 opportunities. We are in the process now of integrating a new technology platform to track both MWBE and Section 3 utilization and compliance. Other significant initiatives and improvements currently in progress include creation of the Procurement Help Desk for centralized intake of procurement inquiries, improved internal and external con communications through monthly internal newsletters and quarterly vendor newsletters, inventory management and optimization efforts, requisition to pay process improvements, e-commerce integration, and otherwise known as punch out, contract management initiative, and enhancement of the vendor responsibility framework, including the use of Dun & Bradstreet supplier risk manager tool enterprise-wide. Going forward as part of our vision for continuous improvement efforts, procurement will look to improve the authority's contract management function, including enhancing the contractor performance evaluation and monitoring tools incorporating vendor diversity and selection criteria where available, upgrading procurement technology, developing a formal sustainable procurement policy, procurement training to support the neighborhood model, professional development and certification, and continued pursuit of excellence. Lastly, and consistent with our values, we would like to strengthen ties with residents and ensure, th ensure their feedback is incorporated into our operations and vendor performance. Thank you for your continued partnership and support to our work to transform NYCHA and strengthen the community. We are happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you so much uh, for your testimony. Thank you. Generally, we have um, residents who participate at the top of the meeting. Unfortunately, they are not yet here. So when they do, we will be sure to integrate them in the lineup. Um, I guess with that, we can um, begin questions. I guess I'm gonna um, provide courtesy to Council Member Barron, who unfortunately has to depart very quickly. So, Council Member Barron. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. I always appreciate your um, niceness and kindness, I appreciate that very much. I do have to vote on a project in land use. But what I didn't hear, unless I missed it, what is your record for hiring Section 3 residents? You know, I don't think, you, we always talk about the improvement of the program and we're gonna do these initiatives, unless I missed it, in each of the developments, I, mean, I wanna know, have you been in compliance with Section 3 uh, in these developments? And also, the um, challenges of having your RAD and PAT program and then also having a compliance with Section 3. Because I know in many of developments in my area, particularly in Linden Houses and Cypress, Pink Houses, you know, they just don't see these Section 3 jobs coming through. Not only not with the companies, but not even with the residents. And there's been a lot of development, you know, millions, billions of dollars worth of development, but it just never happens. And we talk about improvement, and we're gonna do it better, and minority and woman-owned contracts, and even those are subcontracts, the major contracts, the billions that I see in this, doesn't go to um, 
our people, black and brown people. That just doesn't happen. And when I saw the list of all the major contracts, the billions of dollars, that doesn't come to us. We don't even get the millions, much less the billions. So I just would like to see your record of hiring in Section 3, and not just the low-level Section 3 jobs, because oftentimes it is said that, oh, you just don't have the skills, or if you're a uh, company, you don't have the capacity. That's the other racist word they use, capacity. And all of the white companies had an opportunity to get contracts without having capacity. They built the capacity by getting these contracts so they can develop capacity. So those kinds of things happen in contracting around the city, and NYCHA especially. So I just would like to know more about your actual record of hiring in relationship to the 30 percent of the contract and different levels, the 10 percent for the businesses, uh, some record of that. Uh, thank you, Council Member. Um, in regards to uh, NYCHA hiring for Section 3, uh, we are looking to meet our requirements as far as uh, the CFR is concerned. Uh, we are continuing to improve that. At this stage, when we look at the progress that we've made from 2019, 2020, and 2021, we've increased our hiring now from 13 percent originally in 2019 of total hires to 20 percent. That is yeah, still but I know before you do that, yes. I, I want to break down, if we could send it to my office, oh, of uh, those actual numbers. Of course. And 15, 13, and 20 percent is not 30 percent. 30 percent is too low. So if you're not even meet, meeting 30 percent, because we are in desperate times in our communities, so your gradual improvement is hurting us. Right. So we're not looking for gradual improvement. 30 percent, 30 percent, and it should be done. And if there's any impediments, impediments for it being done, then let's talk about that. But no more we have 13 percent, and then next year we have 15 percent, and the next year we have 18 percent. We're at 20 now. Pretty soon we'll be at 25, and pretty soon we'll be dead. So we need to have those jobs right away, especially in these low-income neighborhoods, which mostly where NYCHA is. The employment opportunities are incredibly missing. And NYCHA has an opportunity to do something about that, not gradually, but expeditiously and immediately. Thank you. We'll provide you with that information, sir. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. So um, will NYCHA provide us uh, the exact numbers of Section 3 hires that occurred in 2019, 2020, and 21 specifically? And we'd like to know, how does NYCHA track Section 3 hires? So NYCHA uh, tracks Section 3 hires. Um, uh, number one, when a, a vendor provides their proposal, they're required to provide a hiring plan. The hiring plan is then re reviewed by the agency, by Reese, and then at that point we know what the expected hires need to be under that contract. Yeah. At, a point, at a point of every single invoice that's submitted, the vendor is supposed to provide their hiring report that outlines uh, their employment over that period of the invoice's time. And how often does the agency go back to that hiring plan to verify that, I guess, during the life of whatever the project is, that it maintains and retains? Um, so on a quarterly basis, we're reviewing whether or not uh, vendors are meeting those hiring plans and issue cure notices to the vendors um, accordingly. What happens when uh, there is backsliding in the hiring plans? What are the, what are the tools that NYCHA has at its disposal? There's a number of contract provisions within the contract to mitigate those issues. Obviously, we try to work with our vendors and to, to address those, those concerns. Um, but in the end, all the way through to cancellation, the contract is available to NYCHA in regards to non-performance. I guess how often do you have, have you encountered this issue? Um, it, it's, compliance is an issue that we continue to struggle with. Uh, we are currently working on, on bringing forward a, a, an electronic uh, tracking for both utilization as well as compliance to bring certified payroll uh, to really assist us with that effort. Okay, given, given that we're 
a little bit out of order. I'd like to kind of go back to the top around uh, procurement and, and contracts, and certainly we'll make our way back. We'll be a little fluid, so thank you uh, for courtesy on that. Um, if we could go back, actually, I would like to acknowledge Council Member Ayala was here one minute ago. I think Marlene Mealy was here. Oh, okay, and Council Member Mealy. Um, but in terms of if we could just take a step back to kind of the, the fundamentals for the record, um, can you uh, walk us through the contracting process? How long does each phase of the process generally take Okay. on average? So the, 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 the timing is going to really rely upon the totality of all the circumstances on the procurement, so I'll, I'll wrap that at the end. You know, the first thing is to really determine, you know, what is the need at hand? Um, at that point, then, either the programmatic area or the purchasing, the buyer, will determine whether an existing contract actually exists. Okay, that's first and foremost. Thereafter, then, um, the governmental estimate and the, um, the subject matter of the procurement also weighs into um, uh, how to go about the process uh, going forward. The other element is the funding source. So once you have those three elements, then the PPM prescribes exactly the, the method for which uh, we need to either manage competition or manage noticing of the public, or for that matter, to the extent that it needs to be um, approved by the board, depending on the dollar amount. Um, at this point, um, our, I do have the award time. So if in a micro under 5,000, it takes us approximately seven days to process. For awards between five and 250,000, generally it's between 60 and 90 days. There's an element of noticing to the public that's required in those particular contracts, another level of due diligence, so to speak. Above 250,000 to a million, a million being our threshold for board review, takes between 90 and 120 days. And above a million dollars, which again requires board review, is then 120 to 150 days. What was the dollar amount that you said for 60 to 90 days? Um, I apologize. Uh, for 60 to 90, between 5,000 and 250,000. Thank you. So. Quite a range. Um, what was the total amount of dollars that were obligated under contracts for fiscal 21? For fiscal 21, I believe it was $2.13 million. That's correct. $2.13 billion in total contract spend for 2021. I also have a breakdown of that, if you would like, by, by type. That would be great. We okay. would, we'd like to see that. Sure. Um, the micro th uh, micros uh, were a little over $80 billion. That was 4% of our spend. Small purchases were $38.9 million, comprising 2% of our spend and large contracts, a little over $2 billion, comprising 94% of our spend. And, and do you retain a breakdown for each development? Uh, from a budget standpoint, yes. Great. We are looking, if I may, uh, we are looking to continue to bring more procurement contracts and a portfolio contracts to the development level. That's a level of specificity uh, that we're starting to build that now. But from Great. a budget standpoint, yes, ma'am. Yeah, we're definitely interested in seeing how how expenditures are spread across the developments and where what are the trends we're seeing there in terms of some developments maybe um, having access to more micro contracts or, or the larger contracts, mm -hmm. vice versa. So we'd like to definitely follow up on that. Would you be able to um, send us the total amount of dollars obligated in contracts for each of the previous five fiscal years? Five? Yes. And I'm sorry, we were just talking about the contracts awarded per development. Is that that's in process? Are you able to report region totals or development totals at this point? E expense is, is easy for the agents. Oh, I shouldn't speak to that. I apologize. You know, expense by development can be provided by our finance office, I'm sure. 
Uh, what I mentioned was um, our contracts by development, which I think is a, a key uh, integration point between both spend as well as utilization at the development level and meeting the residents' needs. That is something that is under development. We have a lot of centralized contracts that to the prior council member's question, you know, we're looking to move more to the development level to deal with our diversity goals and meeting more particular requirements as opposed to looking at things from a, you know, we're a large organization from a central office, central contracting standpoint. Yeah, I, I think that that challenge of not being able to, um, to produce development contracts also leads to this question of monitoring and oversight of the contracts. Uh, what we have heard from the field um, is in fact, that's one of the key reasons why bad behavior is not put in check and there's no way to monitor if you have a contract that is um, spanning several developments, there's no way to track where the workers are supposed to be and so how, how does NYCHA currently handle monitoring contracts that span several developments? It, it all depends on the, on the, the administering department um, and how they go about managing those particular contracts. There are central elements that, that, um, that take into account a more holistic view on managing the contracts and then that drills down to the development level and those roles and responsibilities. So what are the most common jobs that NYCHA contracts out for? So from a contracting standpoint, uh, procurement standpoint, I should say, you know, we try to look at everything that's potentially foreseeable. So there really are no uh, particular areas that we, we try to identify all needs um, proactively. So with regards to uh, services, both construction, standard, and professional, you know, we run a full portfolio. We try to run a full portfolio of resources for our programmatic areas to then make the decision whether it's in the best interest of the program areas, given the mission and given the totality uh, of all issues to either um, utilize a contract or utilize in-house uh, resources. And is that an assessment you do for every contract or is that an annual assessment you're doing in terms of a more macro level I guess positioning. That's that's a really good question. Um, it, it is now part of our forecasting effort. We're now reaching our second year of our forecasting effort with our program program areas to identify what those needs are in advance of the budget year, um, in order to really put forward a procurement plan um, that not only uh, meets the, the program's needs, but then our other policy goals as well as uh, effective time for outreach to the vendor community and what have you. So we're in our second iteration of that forecasting effort. In terms of um, uh, cost, cost overruns, which is something we have heard quite a lot about, um, what's the total cost of contract overruns for each fiscal year? And will you be able to provide them for the last five years? I do not have that um, available to me, but I we will get back to the committee on that. Great, we look forward to receiving that. Um, also, in terms of, we'd like to know what percentage of the NYCHA contracts are completed on time and on budget? That's another question that we can come back to the committee on. Get back to me. Um, Free to, free to jump in too, I'm sorry. Okay. Right. Good morning. Good morning. I just want to make sure everyone's awake. I know that contracts can be a procurement, you know, it's such a sexy topic. We want to make sure that everyone is staying awake today. <laughs> okay. So thank you for breaking down the, um, the total amount, the 2.13 billion. I want to go back to your opening statement. You had said on page three that NYCHA continues to seek legislative changes that would mitigate these challenges and allow for best value procurements of goods and construction services that would blah, blah, blah. So can you tell me how you're seeking legislative changes? Because we would love to assist you. Uh, you know, we put those, this will be the second year that I'm with NYCHA that we will put our legislative changes in writing to our governmental affairs folks, and then uh, they go about that process. Uh, I, I can't speak specifically as to how that's undertaken. But Can you, you describe what the legislative changes are, what oh, those in requests particular? are? Sure, so uh, with, with the, the PHL 151 requires a sealed bid for the procurement of goods in excess of 25,000 
It also requires a sealed bid for DACAR, demolition, excavation, construction, alteration, and renovation services. Um, as I mentioned in my testimony, total cost of ownership in respect to the goods, you buy something, how long, how much is it going to take to maintain both as a parts and, and warranty and all those elements are much easier to do in an RFP process, a requ request for proposal, as opposed to a sealed bid that has very prescriptive uh, specifications. Um, the same goes for instances where construction may have a number of different service-related elements that are also lend themselves to be qualifications-based review. Um, all of those really weigh in positively to our ability to, to have better vendors. The last point that I'd like to make in regards to sealed bid as opposed to RFP is we're now undertaking, we just started, but undertaking diversity as an element of criteria in our RFP evaluation. And that will give us the ability to also include diversity in our evaluation of, of RFPs for construction and related services, which is really the corpus of our contracting dollars. Is this mostly with state law then? This is state law. I apologize. Okay. Yes. Thank you for clarifying. And can you help me understand the difference between um, the procurements, procurement policies that require you to differentiate between micro and small? So it, it's a matter of threshold. Our micro, th it's a matter of dollars. So the threshold right currently right now is uh, 10,000. And um, we are looking at, uh, because of our MWBE first at Section 3 policy, we are looking with the federal government to increase that to 50,000, which gives us some fre flexibility there. Then at the small purchase level, there's a number of, of movements here between 10 to 250,000 professional services and standard services are by small purchase requiring a, a notice period to the public and uh, three bids and a buy. And then from 25 to 250 also need to be done by small purchase. And then day car from 50 to 250 needs to be done by small purchase. So it's both the dollar amount and the good of whatever and the type, is being purchased. And, and the, the subject type. matter. Okay. That's correct. Thank you. Can I ask a clarifying yeah. question? So are each of these micro purchases, uh, I guess how are they awarded and tracked, my, both micro and the small purchases? Um, tracked in our Oracle ERP system and our, in our procurement system with the agency. I would also like to note that any of the, the, le trust, uh, the legislation recommendations that we made, um, you know, many uh, changes were part of the trust legislation. Uh, these changes must be done, but although on a state level now. So. Yeah, but uh, the majority of units are not going to be in the trust. Um, so how are we addressing all those units? The, the units, excuse me? The, you, the, the trust only covers 25,000 units. How are you addressing all the other units that are outside of the trust? Th thank you for that. That in addition to the fact that, that much of what I bring in, in, in wanting the changes to the legislation speaks to the maintenance of contracts, the maintenance contracts as opposed to those that are of a comprehensive modernization sort of nature. Thank you. I, w I was curious about the, um, in terms of the small, in, in terms of the no bid contracts, can you tell us how many no bid contracts were awarded in 2019? Uh, and also uh, through this uh, past fiscal year consecutively? I do have that number. Bear with me for a second. So procurement by type, if you will. Um, we have a number of, of non-competitives, if that's what you mean by no bid. Um, we have uh, sole source, emergencies, okay. Uh, by uh, by sole source, uh, I'll give you the, the date, uh, the, the last couple years. In 2020, we had 78 uh, POs that were sole sourced for a total of 28.9 million. And in 2021, we had 56 POs for a total of 8.3 million. Uh, for emergencies in 2020, we had 38 
POs for 186 million. And in 2021, 63 POs for a total of 35.4 million. So the, thir uh, the 38 POs valued at 168 million was what year? 2020. 2020. Correct. I'll take a wild guess, the surge in, in that related to COVID. Correct. Can you explain the relationship between NYCHA and, the, and MOX, as well as what the difference is between your relationship with other city agencies? So our relationship with MOX, uh, it, it's a collaboration. You know, I, I do uh, speak to, um, to folks at MOX, mostly in, in terms with, in regards to passport that we use for purposes of our VR process, our vendor registration, pro um, vendor responsibility process. That's our cert certifications and representations. Um, and then also just, you know, generally speaking, best practices and what have you. Uh, other agencies in particular, I would note DCAS and DOIT are two key agencies that really, their contracts serve uh, NYCHA significantly to leverage spend across the city. Um, on the DCAS side, it's more in, in the lines of, of goods and some uh, services. And then obviously with um, ITS, it's uh, information technology contracts and what have you. Also to save efficiency, time, and money. Can you help me understand the controller's role in respect to NYCHA contracts as a city controller? So it's for my understanding is that with the, in the contract, the controller's role, uh, number one, just from an overall um, auditing standpoint, you know, we are subject to comptroller review. Um, and then in regards to those contracts that are, or projects that are funded through city dollars uh, are required to go through, uh, through the comptroller for registration. How many capital projects does NYCHA currently have in procurement design and construction phase? I'll defer to uh, Sean Mavani, our, our CACMO. Thank you, Chair One. Um, so currently across those three phases, we have 446 active projects. The largest number is in construction today, 201 projects. Um, and then we have 134 projects that are in the design phase, and that leaves the remaining 111 projects that are in the procurement phase. According to the most recent monitors report, NYCHA's capital projects for heating, elevators, waste management are behind schedule on average between nine and 12 months, and these delays are increasing. The report highlighted that these delays were not properly disclosed since NYCHA was reporting that the projects were generally on time. Can you walk us through how NYCHA established project schedules, what changes did the monitor recommend, and can more modifications be made to identify challenges and obstacles on an earlier time frame? Uh, thank you, Chair. I very much appreciate the opportunity uh, to talk about the important work that we're doing in this area of project controls and reporting. Um, in the monitor's report, um, which was uh, very helpful for us in many ways, they also comment that and recognize this progress that we've been making uh, over the last year around strengthening our procedures uh, and tools to plan, track, and deliver capital projects. Other improvements in management and controls um, that we've put in place in line with industry best practice and they cite a specific set of improvements that we've uh, already completed, uh, our revised procedures manual, our new scheduling and inspection teams, new management systems and metrics, improved schedules and documentations for key portfolio, and lastly, um, they comment on the careful review and quality control of the quarterly and monthly reports that we provide on our capital projects. Um, in terms of how we set schedules, uh, let me just uh, walk you through that step by step. Um, we maintain standard schedule templates um, that vary by project scope of work, project delivery method, and funding source. Uh, all three of these impact the specific activities and durations in the schedule. When a project is initiated, uh, the assigned project team undertakes scoping and site studies. They engage with stakeholders and they develop a project scope, which then uh, leads to customizing the appropriate schedule template. The proposed schedule is reviewed and validated by more senior staff uh, for each project, as well as independent senior schedulers who review for schedule quality, uh, appropriateness of task durations, uh, and schedule logic. Uh, once any adjustments are made based on the feedback given to the project team, the schedule is approved, 
and it becomes um, uneditable in the system without further senior staff approvals. Um, the changes that the monitor team recommended uh, in their report to improve schedule performance um, covered four areas. Uh, first, that our schedules should be less aggressive and allow longer timeframes for certain activities and uncertainties than we have in the past. Secondly, that we consider bundling together more projects as we do for certain portfolios today uh, if that could streamline certain processes around procurement and approvals in particular. Um, that we validate schedule logic more rigorously during that schedule review process and that we work with our city partners to streamline various of the approval process that we are uh, mandated to go through uh, where it is a city funded project. So these recommendations uh, very closely track to transformation strategies that we've already initiated uh, with the restructuring of NYCHA's capital projects function uh, earlier this year. Uh, one of our central initiatives is focused on enhancing our scheduling templates and our schedule management policies and controls based on the data that we've gathered over the last few years around project performance and drawing on industry best practice. Uh, a second major initiative that we've uh, started is to formalize our risk management approach in the way we manage project schedules and costs. This initiative will introduce new risk tools and indicators that can flag potential delays earlier for mitigation, again, based on industry practices. Um, in terms of your, your last question um, around more modifications that could be made to identify challenges and obstacles earlier, uh, I'm confident that these initiatives that we've put in place earlier this year will significantly uh, improve our ability to do exactly that, to manage our project schedules as they're implemented in the next few months. Um, and in addition to that, we do have a range of efforts to address specific causes of delays that we have found were most frequent in the last few years uh, during procurement design and construction. Currently in my district, Woodside Houses has been without heat and hot water this past winter. Every single week, NYCHA would tell me that there is a supply chain issue. And when I asked them exactly what contract, exactly which item, they would not answer. What are you going to do to provide more transparency in the process, especially for capital projects that is so incredibly urgent. I have seniors living without heat and hot water even today, and winter is coming again, and the water boiler and the heat is heating plant is still not fixed, even though I have in writing from email that both um, the leadership and NYCHA have told me that it will be fixed by March this past year. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Wan. Let me defer to uh our CEO, Eva Trimble, as that particular project is implemented by our operations functions. Good morning, Chairwoman. Uh, thank you for that question. We understand the project at Woodside has um, been more delayed than we, than we wanted, and it's been a, a struggle since uh, you know Ida took out all the boilers in 2021. That was very unfortunate. Um, since then, we've been working to uh, to replace all the boilers. As you know, there have been three mobile boilers that have been set up. I know that they're very large and, and very difficult at the site, but there were there was always heat and hot water provided by those mobile waters, mobile no. boilers throughout, throughout the season. Uh, and we had expected them to be um, completed in April. We had a DOB inspection in April 2022 that required additional work. And so we've been working to complete the DOB requirements. DOB is actually scheduled to come back to the site today, later this afternoon, to do another inspection. And we're hopeful that, that um, we will get the boilers approved by DOB, and then we can turn them on. The, uh, the plan is that we will be running the new boilers at Woodside for about 30 days. And once we know that they are working and providing heat and hot water, we will start to disassemble the mobile boilers. And it'll take about two weeks per each mobile boiler to remove them from the site. So about six, six weeks or so total. And our plan is to hopefully have them removed um, very shortly. Thank you. The NYCHA monitor suggests that NYCHA should expand and approach use, approach the U expand the approach used on Sandy recovery projects to secure critical equipment directly from suppliers before awarding a contract to a general contractor. Just like you heard, right, for Hurricane Ida, it flooded our Woodside houses, not only the heating plant, but also furniture that continues to flood even two weeks ago when, it, when there was heavy rain. So is this something that NYCHA is planning to explore, and, and do you see this as a benefit to NYCHA? Thank you. So yes, in the context of the larger capital portfolios that we have, 
this can be a useful strategy similar to Sandy. We have a very large number of, for example, elevator projects that are ongoing today under the HUD agreement. Given the specific supply chain issues we're seeing in 2022 and that may continue in future years, we're exploring the same strategy of how to um, secure uh, materials, equipment, parts uh, uh, earlier in the process um, with vendors and using our vendor relationships to do that. We have taken a similar approach in the very large mayoral roofing program that we run. Um, we have worked to um, procure uh, insulation and other materials early and stockpile those so that they're available when we get to the right construction phase. Um, applying the same approach more broadly um, can be challenging around uh, when we have uh, get funding in play the monitor report in specifically um, recommends looking at um, securing items even before we contract with construction contractors, which is uh, an innovative uh, idea which we'll, we'll be looking into together with them. Currently, any public resident can look on the NYCHA website to see what repairs or what tickets are open currently for each NYCHA complex, like for heating outages, hot water outages. Do you have any plans in place to provide even more transparency? Because people are tired of opening tickets after tickets after tickets, and now a year has passed and they still don't have heat and hot water. And then when I call NYCHA telling people they still don't have hot water, then they say, well, we don't have any more tickets open because they continue to get closed before they're resolved. So are you going to have some sort of update on your website to show residents of what the holdup is and when it would be closed for the timeline and the schedule that you're describing, especially for large capital projects that affect their daily life? So let me answer on the side of capital projects. Uh, in April of this year, we released a um, publicly facing capital projects tracker where a resident can go in um, in a very user-friendly uh, interface, uh, we believe, look for any projects that are active at their development, what is the latest in terms of the timeline, uh, what is happening in the project today, and we, will, uh, we are working on enhancing the information that's available in that tracker now that we have several months of resident and other stakeholder feedback on that process. I would just add that that tracker is directly linked to our project management system, so it's um, you know, biweekly updated real-time information that does give residents and stakeholders the most accurate view of where things are on each project. That's great. Could you say the website hyperlink for us out loud, like a commercial? <laughs> um, I, yes, I can. Um, the website hyperlink, uh, it is linked uh, right on NYCHA's homepage, so I would mention that. Um, if you go on NYCHA's homepage, there is a panel called the Capital Projects Tracker that'll take you there directly, and that's probably the easiest way. Um, the actual um, tracker is https colon slash slash my dot NYCHA dot info slash public site slash CPD slash. Uh, again, though, I think uh, going to NYCHA's homepage and looking for Capital Projects Tracker may be the easiest um, pathway. Thank We're you. We're going to have to get a better website for that <laughs> website name. Thank you. For the procurement office, how many staffers work under the NYCHA's chief procurement officer? What are their roles? We currently have a little over 250 uh, um, staffers that are on current payroll. I believe we are budgeted for 284, and we have a number of vacancies um, currently. Do you feel that you are adequately staffed in the procurement office? You know, I, I think at this point, um, you know, given the budget constraints and whatnot, we, ha we get a lot of support from our finance uh, department. Given the transformation and so forth, obviously we would always entertain more staff, uh, but we are doing what we can with what we have. And in particular, as you remember, recall from my testimony, we've converted a number of administrative functions consolidated those functions to create efficiencies and put more buyers um, to, uh, to really get to the work of what we need to do. Thank you. I want to acknowledge Council Member Gail Brewer has joined. In terms of, um, oh gee, I just lost my. We have like 18 pages of questions, but I want to give the courtesy to my colleagues who are patiently waiting. Uh, Councilmember Olsay. 
Thank you so much, Chair Viles and Chair Juan. Um, hello to the administration. Nice to see you all. Good morning. Uh, I represent the 36th district, which includes Bedford, Stuyvesant, and Northern Crown Heights, and we have a sizable number of NYCHA developments, and uh, every single time I attend a resident association meeting or an event at the developments, uh, constituents will tell me that there are still infrastructure needs. Um, I'm sure that's not a surprise to any of you or all of us sitting on the dais. Uh, last June, I went to Albany Houses, their resident association meeting, and residents were upset about the lack of repairs uh, in their home and the lack of response and transparency uh, that they were receiving from management. Um, again, this is a consistent thing that I'm hearing throughout my NYCHA developments uh, within my district. And then in addition to that, uh, on the subject of Albany Houses, um, they also have a, a playground which is in dire need of repair. Um, funds have been allocated to that, that playground, um, and there's still a question of when that playground will finally be reopened and, and finally repaired uh, for uh, the children to play in. Um, so I guess a question that I have for you on top of that is, is what is NYCHA doing to address repairs in capital, in capital projects and how can we ensure that these repairs are done uh, or are being done in the most efficient way possible? Thank you, council member, for that question. Um, I would, I would say that the, the biggest program we have right now to improve our efficiency in doing repairs is our work order reform program, which just launched in Brooklyn in July. And what work order reform does is it decentralizes our skilled trades down to the development or neighborhood level, and it provides a neighborhood planner, which is a single point of contact for residents to call to schedule their repair needs. And the benefit of that is that uh, we're trying to reduce the amount of time where we show up and the residents not home, that we're scheduling repairs at the convenience of our residents, that they have someone to speak to to really talk through the process. It also allows us to schedule repairs more consecutively. So no longer waiting for the plumber to finish before you can even start talking to the plasterer. We really wanna line up repairs back to back. So that program just launched in Brooklyn and we're really looking to see improvements over the next few months in that repair process. So just to add on the capital projects side, um, some of the earlier comments related to uh, improvements in our schedule management and our ability to deliver the projects on time, um, I think will be important to meet some of the uh, concerns and pain points that residents are raising. Um, in the case of the um, Albany Houses Playground, um, uh, is, which is a large uh, playground project for us at over a million dollars, um, that project started construction in March. Um, and should be completing in September, um, so uh, within the next few weeks. Um, many of the playground projects have faced supply chain issues this year, but um, that's been a relatively quick construction period, so we hope that that will meet resident needs. You said it'll be finished this month? Uh, it'll be finished, yes, in September 2022. Great, I will be, you know, if it it's not finished October 1st, you'll hear from me. Um, another issue that I do wanna raise is one of the biggest public health issues in, in my district, and I'm sure in several of our other districts uh, within our NYCHA developments overall is the sanitation issues. Um, it has been reported that there is an overflow of trash in many, many developments and faulty infrastructure, such as clogged or broken trash chutes. Uh, the trash overflow results in an increase of rodents, which is a huge crisis in my district. Um, how are you vetting bids slash hires for contracts that deal with sanitation issues at NYCHA? So, so first off, I'd, li I'd like to just say that if you're, you know, please remind your constituents that if they're having problems with compactors or trash to definitely um, put in those work orders. I know sometimes they get closed, but um, we can't respond if we don't know the situation is there. And so it's really important for us to see those, those work tickets, especially over time. We can see if, if developments are having um, issues with trash, we'll be able to notice that um, from from grounds tickets. Um, we are, you know, grounds I would say is an area where it is more heavily relied upon with internal staff. So we have our caretaking staff who perform the janitorial functions across the development. We are in the process of hiring more, more caretakers right now. And so I think it's, it's important for that, for us to know about that. We also fix our compactors mostly in-house, so we do sometimes um, contract that out 
as well. So it's important that we know um, what's happening and then otherwise we rely, we work closely with Department of Sanitation to ensure pickups for both regular trash and bulk items on a regular basis. I guess the last question, if I may, Chair, is uh, to, to follow up on that. And you say that you do contract out for some of those work orders. And I have a very uh, engaged resident association at many of the NYCHA developments that I have. So they are, um, you know, submitting work orders for uh, broken trash chutes and things of that nature. I'm just wondering, what are the standards that you are looking into for such contracts? Because I've yet to see real change uh, with the sanitation issue in all of my NYCHA developments. Again, sanitation on a day-to-day -day basis is, is a NYCHA staff issue. So if you're seeing um, dirty grounds and dirty developments, that's something that, that we need to know about so we can address that with our, with our supervisors and with our caretaking staff directly. I, I'm mainly talking about broken trash broken. shoots and you know, people's issue with disposing of their trash within the developments. Is that also internal? For, for the most part, it's internal as well. And, and you know, trash shoots, compactors, is you know, something that we, we, we monitor pretty regularly um, because that is a fire and health, health and safety issue. So if, if there are, um, you know, definitely bring those to our attention so we can address them and we're happy to talk more with you about specific issues in your development at another time. All right, thank you. And I'm excited to see Albany Houses Playground by October 1st. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Rivera. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. I want to thank the chairs for their leadership, um, especially uh, Council Member Alexa Vilas for the work that you're doing around public housing and for having this hearing and the one that we will be having on Friday specifically on Jacob Reese and the water crisis that transpired. So recently we did have a vendor, a contract issue, make national headlines related to Jacob Reese houses. And I know we will focus on that on Friday, but I do want to ask one question. If you can explain NYCHA's process for retaining environmental monitoring and technologies to test the water quality at Reese houses, how is this vendor selected? And why would NYCHA select a vendor whose certification is in question? And if you could confirm whether they are New York State certified? And then second, had NYCHA retained this vendor previously? And if so, have you had any issues with them before? In this case, they provided a false positive, what you all called an outlier. Is it possible in the past they could have provided similar test results, perhaps a false negative, and whether or not they have any contracts currently in doing business with the city? I do have one other question generally on contracts after this, but I wanted to ask specifically on this development in my district. Thank you for that question. As you mentioned, we are having the oversight hearing on Friday, and we will answer all questions related to Reese on Friday as part of that hearing when we have our technical experts and partner agencies with us at that time. So you can't speak to how the vendor was selected? We will speak to it on Friday. Do you know if they have any other business with the city that's not related to Reese? We will answer all the questions regarding that vendor on Friday as part of the Reese Oversight Hearing. So, all right, today's Tuesday, all day, right? I think as the experts that are sitting here in relation to procurement, you can still answer this question. We would prefer to answer all the Reese questions on Friday as it relates to to that vendor and we will um, be able to explore more thoroughly on Friday all the issues that happened at Reese. I'm happy to discuss it more when we have the full panel that were involved in that, pro with, in that issue on Friday. I will just say that for clarity and transparency purposes, this entire process has been delayed and unacceptable in getting answers to the families of Reese and this city council. So if we're gonna wait three more days to get answers on Friday, I hope that you will answer everything outlined in the letter that was sent to you all by Council Members Brewer and Aviles, in addition to all the questions that you received from local elected officials. A absolutely, we commit to doing that, and I believe a response to the letter um, from Council Members Brewer and Aviles is coming today as requested. Oh, that would be a f refreshing for you all to make a deadline. So let me ask about NYCHA and how you determine estimates. So from my understanding, and you all can correct me if I'm wrong just so I can fully understand the process, NYCHA creates an estimate 
for how much a capital project will cost, and then issues an RFP based on this estimate. I've heard reports that issues with the underlying estimates have caused the need to reissue RFPs, which causes further delays and cost increases. How often do inaccurate estimates lead to delays? And I'll give you an example. I was given an estimate for an elevator at a senior building in Baruch Houses, 72 Columbia, in my district for $1 million and allocated funding for this in 2019. The project still hasn't started and we don't have a timeline for this. Is this estimate accurate and have there been delays based on inaccurate estimates historically? I believe this has also happened in East River Houses, but I'm just gonna speak to what's happened in my district. So th thank you, uh, Councilmember Rivera. Um, so your characterization is correct that we um, undertake an internal uh, independent estimate before we go out for procurement for a project. Um, we review the accuracy of our estimates uh, regularly. Um, we use up-to-date market data and tools that the industry uses. Um, and our uh, procurement policy um, does require um, the bids to be within a certain uh, variance with that estimate for us to move forward early this year. We did amend that policy uh, because of the unique market situation that we're in um, in 2022 and the fact that it's much harder to predict um, at cost escalation than it has been in the past. Um, in the case of um, the Baruch uh, Elevators project, which you, which you highlighted, um, there was an estimate provided up front. Um, we did feel that that project was underfunded. We've subsequently um, supplemented the funding that was provided with additional um, funding that we have available. Um, and now that project, uh, we believe, is moving forward effectively um, uh, into the planning uh, uh, phase and now in the design phase to be able to move forward um, and uh, complete the elevator project. Um, uh, in the next few years. Um, in general, on your question, um, there are a number of reasons that can drive um, a bid process to not be successful, um, whether it would be um, a variance with the cost estimate versus market escalation, um, not having uh, any bidders or enough bidders on a specific project, having bidders that bid but are not responsible or responsive, um, and other scenarios about why we may uh, have failed bids. In general, we have not identified um, in inaccuracy of our cost estimates as a major driver of failed bids. Um, uh, we have seen significant market escalation. Elevators are a good example where costs have escalated from $600,000 per elevator car up to nowadays we're getting bids at $2 million per um, car over the last two years. And so um, tracking how market prices are changing can often lead to um, a problem with um, the cost estimate uh, variance, but as I said, we have made our procurement policies more flexible to deal with that better, um, which uh, you know my colleague, our chief procurement officer, can speak to um, if you have further questions. I just want to thank the chairs for the time, um, and if you can get back to me on, on, on the timeline I heard next few years, and it's certainly been that since 2019. This is a senior high-rise building every year that passes, you know, the money becomes less valuable. Uh, so thank you for clearing that up and thank you uh, to the chairs for the time. I just have one follow-up question. How come the Woodside Houses heating is not on the website? And I'm not seeing a lot of the other capital projects on the website either. I see some of them and it looks great, but some are missing. The heating project is being done by our operations division, not by capital programs. It was a $1.2 million overhaul of those boilers that completed in April, but it was done through operations, so it's not part of the live capital tracker right now. Got it. And then just to clarify, you're saying that it will be done within the next month? Um, the major work completed in April, and then we had follow-up from DO DOB from their inspections that we needed to complete. DOB is back today to inspect that. Um, so we're hopeful that we can have final approval on the boilers. Thank you. I have a, I have a quick follow-up to Council Member Rivera's questions. Um, it is uh, seemingly true that not just, um, you know, costs gone awry post-COVID is a driver um, of these uh, bids that are underestimated. This seems to have been a long systemic issue where council members have allocated resources to their developments 
And within years, because of the long time it has taken, those, those estimates, which I understand weren't even provided to council in years past, are long outdated. Um, begging the question around these particular estimates. And obviously, I'm not asking NYCHA to be the predictor of all market forces, but it seems like there is a persistent um, underestimation and or uh, a particular problem with time frames um, that quickly devalues the project and makes all the work done in the prior years kind of defunct. So I was curious around how you are trying to shorten both the time frames and get better estimations of those projects. Thank you, Chair Vila. So uh, historically, over the last five years, we've faced the same challenge that many city agencies face, that we receive, uh, in particular, um, discretionary funding allocations um, uh, you know, in, in July of the year without any previous engagement, without being able to provide any type of scoping um, support or cost estimation. So I think we did suffer with um, significant delays in early phases of those projects where typically the scope of work that was um, uh, you know, uh, desired by the council member or by the residents was not fully funded and we only found that out once we had the money and could undertake a proper cost estimate in the field. Um, there's a second part of the challenge there is that undertaking a very robust cost estimate does typically require site visits and site surveys which are not funded um, uh, you know, uh, through the city funding um, uh, in advance of the allocations. And so where possible, we do try to utilize our other funding sources to get ahead and do that. In 2022 is the first time that we did engage very proactively earlier in the year with uh, council members through a uh, Capital Council Day to try to uh, work with council members directly to scope and cost estimate projects before funds are allocated. And in 2023, we will start that process even earlier, um, you know, when participatory budgeting and other processes are happening so that we can make sure that we have enough information to provide robust cost estimates in the future. So those um, delays on projects in the last few years for various reasons, um, in particular our discretionary funded work, um, we would hope uh, won't be replicated as we engage earlier with um, uh, council members, borough presidents and other um, funders um, to develop those scopes and cost estimates collaboratively before allocations happen. So if I'm hearing you correctly, are you saying that NYCHA does not have the capacity to do those scoping services to the extent prior, despite PNAs, despite staff, that is an additional body of work that is unfunded? Uh, so I'm saying two things. One is that traditionally um, we haven't um, had the opportunity to engage uh, pre-discretionary funding allocations to uh, talk about scope, um, to uh, talk about what the cost estimate should be, but rather we're doing the cost estimates after the funding was already determined. Um, on the second point is that um, despite having the PNA and site drawings and surveys, one of the major drivers of um, cost escalation in NYCHA's context is unknown site conditions. So, you know, you may fund um, renovation in a community center, and then we would go in and find that once we have to do some construction work, there are other underlying conditions in the community center that will need to be resolved to address the scope fully. And that typically requires doing a um, targeted site survey at that point in time when the project is being scoped, right? Um, and, you know, our uh, internal resources can sometimes undertake that survey or you may need a specialist type of third-party contractor to do some of that work. And that's what's typically not funded. Uh, again, we have more flexibility than other um, city agencies in that we can utilize some of our federal funding to do that scoping. Um, but I know that this is a, a challenge that, that many agencies face. Thank you so much. Um, I have so many more questions about unknown site conditions. Um, but I would like to hand it over to Council Member Sanchez. Thank you so much, Chairs, uh, and thank you for holding this hearing. Uh, so he hello, uh, hello, Nigel, hello, Mox. Um, my questions are actually a follow-up to Councilmember Rivera's, and they're, they're because NYCHA is no stranger to environmental hazards. So with respect to the local law changes, uh, the local laws that change the reference levels for elevated uh, lead, 
a few years ago by this council. I wanted to ask about how compliance is going with that, and particularly um, what number of contracts has NYCHA um, had to make with uh, environmental companies to comply with the changes to, to the lead standards? Um, what sizes are these contracts and who, which are the companies that NYCHA has been contracting with, right? Because the lead reference levels were cut in half for, uh, for paint chips, for lead dust, for window wells, for floors, and you know, of course for children, the elevated blood lead level uh, is now 0.5 micrograms or five micrograms per deciliter. So um, yeah, information on that would be helpful. Thank you, Councilwoman, for that question. Uh, we'll be happy to follow up with you. We don't have that information handy this, this morning, but we will absolutely get back to you on that. Okay, thank you. And just, uh, for, just to emphasize the fact that when we were all negotiating this uh, legislation, when you all were negotiating this with the council, uh, one of the main concerns that HPD and NYCHA expressed about the changes was the, the difficulty that there would be with compliance, that there were not enough companies to uh, you know, make sure that uh, NYCHA complied in time. So please let us know. Um, uh, also, in addition to the in-unit inspections, um, those common area inspections as well, how, uh, how compliance is going and who are the companies that are doing that. Thank you. Council member. I'm sorry, I jumped in. I thought, where, did you have a response for? Okay, <laughs> pardon. Um, Council member Ressler. Sorry, I thought I put the mic on too soon. Um, <laughs> firstly, uh, I really want to thank our co chairs today, uh, Chairs Aviles and Juan. Um, not only is it it makes such a difference when the right people are in the right positions here, and I really appreciate both of your leadership of your respective committees and Councilmember Juan really pushing hard on procurement and Councilmember Aviles pushing hard on NYCHA oversight and accountability. And of course, you both represent, I guess, the two largest NYCHA developments in our city in Queensbridge and Red Hook. So it's great to have you both together and um, shining a light on some of the inadequacies that we unfortunately find at the Housing Authority. I do want to thank you all for being here today. Um, and want to thank Chief Operating Officer uh, Trimble for joining us in the 33rd a few weeks ago. We appreciate you uh, making an effort to come visit one of our seven NYCHA developments early in your tenure. Um, you know, to be charitable, I would say that the NYCHA procurement process and NYCHA's kind of epic failures on Section 3 date back for generations uh, and many decades. And they're, so it's not just your fault. It's been people's faults for a very, very long time. Um, and uh, these broken processes need a tremendous degree of oversight, accountability, resources, innovation uh, for us to see the improvement that our residents deserve. You know, I can tell you in my first eight months in office at, in, in the public housing uh, developments in my district, we've had water outages, gas outages, fires, um, floods, every different, I mean, I'm expecting locusts next. I, I really, like it's, I'm kidding, but I'm not. It's the, the conditions that my neighbors are living in is totally unacceptable. And it's important that we're, that we brought in Council Member Juan and her committee today to highlight how procurement impedes our ability to serve our residents effectively. And, you know, people complain about the city's procurement process being broken, but that NYCHA faces double the challenges because you've got all of the HUD uh, procurement difficulties that you face as well. So I'd like to start with that. Could you speak to the specific advocacy that this administration has undertaken this year relating to changes in HUD procurement policies to allow for greater flexibility for NYCHA to get resources out the door to fund contracts that make a difference in people's lives? What advocacy agenda are you advancing in Washington, D.C. right now? I apologize, uh, Council Member. I just I don't know what the, our advocacy in, specific, in particular is in regards to uh, procurement is in Washington. I will say that what we've been doing over the course of the last 18 months is to use our current tool set, um, which is pretty expansive within the CFR, in order to meet those needs and create those efficiencies that you you know you obviously mentioned was 
you know, you all, the NYCHA leadership team has been quite creative, and I mean that, uh, you know, respectfully, in thinking about how we can pull more resources out of the federal government to bring in to support public housing. And I'm hopeful that it's going to make a real difference, maximizing uh, voucher reimbursements and the like. Um, we have a, we have the majority leader who cares about public housing. We have champions like Congresswoman Velasquez. We have a Democrat in the White House. Fixing HUD's, the limitations that HUD places on nitrous procurement is really important. And so I'm disappointed to hear that you can't think of anything that we've been advocating for to try to, to address the myriad of challenges that HUD and limitations that HUD imposes on nitrous procurement policies. I'll give you one more chance. Yeah, uh, at the federal level, we are working with uh, Representative Torres on, on procurement flexibilities, um, uh, both at the federal level and then, as I've mentioned in my testimony, changes that we would, we would desire at the state level. Uh, okay. But you mentioned in, in your question, you know, I mean, procurement's supposed to be, um, should help the problem as opposed to be a, a, a barrier. And that's what, administratively, within our capacity, we are looking to change what we can now. All right. I'm, I'm sensitive to the time, um, so I'm just going to uh, appreciate the answer, um, or the attempted one. The, uh, I'd like to move to Section 3. Um, I apologize if this was asked and answered, but what was the percent compliance, um, my understanding, it's 30% goal of, uh, hires on NYCHA contracts are Section 3 compliant. What was the numbers in 21? I believe the goal is 25, though. Is that correct, Shanna, just to make sure? It's 25% hires? It's 25% hires. In 2020, we are at 20%. And in 2020? 20, uh, excuse me, 2021. We're at 20%. Isn't that mandate 30%? So in November 2020, a new rule went into effect by HUD, and so that shifts the metric to 25% of labor hours um, instead of the 30% new, new hire target. And that's for contracts that are executed um, on or after November 30th, 2020. So it was a shift to hours rather than a percent of people. Mm -hmm. And that, and just wondering for 2020, how did we do on the percent of people? In 2020, our compliance was at 14%. In oh, 2021, at, we're at 20%. Sorry, 2020 on, as a percent of working hours? 14%. That was working hours, not per, percent of hires? Hires. Excuse We're, me, my numbers, we can get back to you specifically on that. Your numbers for 21 as the 20% figure you raised, is, is that for hires or is that for working hours or for both? It's for hires. For hires. So it's the change that they made to working hours, what was the percent there for 2020? One, whatever the most recent year's data is. We're currently in the process of defi HUD's defining the... Because you said that you were at 20%, but you were 20% of hires, but, you're cha but you said that the goal is 25%, which is for working hours. I, I have to say, and I, I want to point this to the mayor's office, time and again, we have this testimony that includes zero data. There is no accountability that we are getting. And we show up to these hearings and we ask questions and we get a very hard time getting straight answers on simple data questions. And then we ask for follow-up and it never comes. And I'm just getting increasingly frustrated as a council member that we are asking for answers and we're not getting them. It's not just today, it's time and again. So I really hope that the mayor's office can work with agencies to provide data in testimony so that we can get clear answers to what is going on. Do you want to try again on this one? I'm sorry. I just want to add in to clarify that with the change to the new rule and changing of the metric into labor hours, um, we're at a grace period now in terms of our Section 3 reporting to HUD and are awaiting HUD's guidance on a new uh, template for a Section 3 report that would report out labor hours. Okay. I I'll just close if, if, the, if, Madam, if the chairs would give me 10 more seconds. Please look to us as partners. 
We desperately want to see the promise of Section 3 finally realized. If there are resources that we can help bring to the resident training academies, if there are models that are working at Reese that you think that we can expand upon and bring city resources to support, if there are workforce organizations that we should be investing in, if there are contractors that are doing their jobs, we want to see clear accountability from every single contractor that is contracted with NYCHA on what Section 3 metrics they are hitting every single contractor. And then we want you to choose not to contract with those, with those vendors that are failing to hit Section 3 metrics. We want you to take into account the Section 3 metrics and their success on those metrics in whether you're choosing to contract with those vendors again. We need to finally treat this goal as a mandate. This has to be a guiding principle of the agency and of the city as a whole to employ public housing residents in public housing contracts. So I'm sorry for getting so worked up, but this one is really important and it's time we finally make it right. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Council member Brewer. Thank you very much. I first want to always say thank you to Brian Honan because I know that he's well known to everybody, but he's very helpful. Um, in terms of parking lots, I know that's something that's not on everybody's agenda, but at Wise Towers, um, it is now, I have to say, unfortunately, uh, pack rat. But the parking lot is still NYCHA. And I have nothing but complaints constantly from residents. So how is that contract let? It lacks LAX parking services. Um, there are problems with, I paid. I, my car still got a boot. Why? Getting information is very difficult. What's the status with lax and why are they the vendor and what's their history? Council member, we'll get back to you on, on that detail on that contract. I okay. apologize, I don't have that with me. Okay, just generally who, parking lots, how does that work? Is that run by an outside vendor generally or is it you directly? I believe our, the vendors um, uh, are managed by our finance department, but I'll get you that, that detail in that background. Okay, number two, I wanna follow up on the uh, council member about sanitation. So my understanding is because it's improved, uh, you know, after 40 years, I know when it's better. Um, but the issue is, my understanding is that between you and uh, Department of Sanitation, they're gonna be uh, bins and other ways of doing sanitation. Can you comment on that? Because that's a big issue, obviously. Forget the shoots, that's another story, but just on the ground, are there gonna be differences in how garbage is collected on the ground? Uh, good morning, council member. Are, are you asking about between, how we break up between our staff and vendors in, in doing sanitation? My understanding from uh, Department of Sanitation is there gonna be a different way of um, making sure that it's not in bags on the street. We, what's that? Can we get me pilot bar so I can put some water in the bag? I can reach back. Okay. So, Council Member, we can provide you full details on that, but there's a number of innovative pilot projects um, that we've tried to design with uh, DSNY um, that are part of the housing plan of the city to do exactly what you're saying, um, to pilot different types of bins or smart bins right. at NYCHA sites to get the bags off of the curb. And we would you know, work with DSNY to develop out a model that can be scaled up okay. more broadly. It's, it's a semi-contracting issue, so I don't want to belabor it, but I'm just saying it's a huge um, issue. Now the scaffolding, there's a question in our uh, questions about Amsterdam and the worker who fell because of the lack of, um, I would say, safety precautions and training from the contractor. With these endless uh, contracts that are doing major, major repairs, um, how, how is that, I just looked at the website that you mentioned, it's okay, if you could ask me, I could give you some improvements, it's not real time, you mentioned playgrounds when a development has four playgrounds and it says playground, how the hell are you supposed to know which playground it is? Use it by its name, something more specific. Because if you're a resident, I don't know that you're gonna, or any of us are gonna know what it is specifically. And I know the time frames are off. You gotta update it on a regular basis. Um, but the question is with these contractors for like Amsterdam houses, how does one know when it's going to end? How does one know what the constant work schedule is, et cetera. In this case, you know me, I'm on top of everything. Rosalba Rodriguez from my office knows everybody, everywhere, and so she follows up. But 
how does one know for residents, keeping them up to date, how long that is going to take? What's, what's the process for information? That's a major, major contracting. Sure, thank you so much uh, for the question. So around our, our capital projects, um, throughout the capital project, we have regular touch points with uh, residents, um, along with other stakeholders, uh, property staff, et cetera. Um, from the initial kickoff uh, through the design, and then especially when we get closer to construction. So as a standard, we have a pre-construction meeting uh, involving the uh, tenant association leadership um, are invited. Um, we have a construction kickoff, again, that involves residents. Yep. And then we hold a biweekly meeting during any construction activity, um, where again, we invite the TA, uh, the tenant association, um, re relevant uh, property staff and others to go through what is coming up the next two weeks, any type of concerns there are, any type of issues there are, how those can best addressed by the different contractors that might be on site. Okay. And, I, I mean, I, do, I guess with Amsterdam houses, if somebody could get back to us about the status, I mean, obviously it's endless, it's major, it's huge, it's rats, it's everything, and it could be better. All right. Finally, um, the issue that was brought up earlier, uh, I know that you have to reject lower bids because they come in way over estimates. And you heard this earlier, you're improving it, but is it something that you have to pick the lower bids? Obviously, we've had this conversation about other contracts and other agencies, but is that something that's necessary because you obviously the lower the bid, you often get the lower the quality. So is this ne necessary? Why does it happen? Help me with the bid process because that seems to be the major complaint. The person who's doing the contracting in the building is lousy, and I just assume because they get the lower bid, and that's the problem. What's the status with trying to find? Now, I know a lot of people don't want to bid with NYCHA. I have lots of friends, they won't touch NYCHA because they're afraid they're not going to get paid, they don't want to deal with you, et cetera. How do you get better contractors? You pay them more, and obviously you pay them on time. So what's the status with that issue of lower bids, getting lower contractors, quality? It, it, is, a, it is a legal requirement, the peg to, um to the governmental estimate, that's something that, that's always a challenge. Uh, we'll, we'll provide you with that site as to the law. When you say legal requirement, city, state, or federal? That I, I, unfortunately, I don't have that on the top of my head. I'll, I'll get you that particular legal site. But wouldn't that be something that you would fight against because that doesn't that end up with the quality issue? It would be that in addition to requirements, for example, of um, the cap of five-year contracts, so we can't really you know, monetize, you know, the, the value of, a, of work and performance over a larger period that benefits vendors as well as us as an agency. There's, there's a number of, of uh, constraints that... Okay, those constraints seem to be the heart of the problem that NYCHA has to advocate to change. Am I right about that? You are correct, Council Okay, Member. 40 years, you kind of learn just a few things. Finally, Harborview, I know it's not a contract issue, for God's sake, hire Trinity out of Boston, hire Philip and build the 100% affordable housing at Harborview. Everybody wants it. It's a mandate of Hudson Yards. I voted for it. I negotiated it. Harborview, Trinity, the RFP is out. <coughs> Secured and done. Thank you very much. Thank you, Council Member Burr. I'd like to follow up on the situation with Amsterdam houses. Um, where we know on April 30th, 2021, a worker fell 30 feet uh, after stepping on a rotten scaffolding plank. Um, after the fall, the worker was taken to a nearby hospital, and according to news reports, uh, Pizarotti LLC failed to show DOB that the worker was adequately trained. Can you tell us what oversight NYCHA does conduct when a contractor is actually awarded a contract? And does NYCHA vet contractors and subcontractors in particular before they get hired? So prior to award, we obviously go through a vendor responsibility process. We work collaboratively with uh, DOI and our inspector general to do a vendor name check. They go through a number of different um, city, state, and federal resources to identify uh, issues that may preclude award um, with respect to responsibility, first and foremost. Secondly, then, uh, you know, on an ongoing basis, we, we look to monitor performance. That cadence depends upon the programmatic area and the subject matter of the particular contract and the vendor. Um, in addition to that, we're looking to implement additional tools, like I mentioned in my testimony, Dun & Bradstreet as a supplier risk tool, 
um, and putting those sorts of tools enterprise-wide in order to mitigate uh, risk and what have you. So through that process, is, is the same person moving a contract through these various processes, or are these moving to different departments? That's a good question. Uh, as part of the, the reorganization and reengineering, we're looking to consolidate a lot of the, that sort of policy and process and function uh, in a hybrid format where the subject matter experts stay within the particular um, uh, programmatic areas, but still be able to manage things consistently across the whole agency. Um, as I mentioned in my testimony, we're training our, our, our buyers to be end-to-end -end so that we're, they're responsible from that determination of need once we receive that until contracts are, are issued. Um, in regards to vendor responsibility and ethics and what have you, we do have a separate unit that works with our DOI and OIG partners mm -hmm. to ensure uh, responsibility. That uh, bifurcation, for lack of a better word, does present a good opportunity to ensure that, um, that vendors are being evaluated for responsibility, separate and apart from uh, those particular needs uh, of a procurement or of the programmatic staff. So in terms of um, uh, how often are job sites inspected that are contracted out? Obviously, I know they vary in scale, and that's a, it's a harder question, but how often are they inspected? Uh, Chair Vilas, you are referring to our capital projects work? Yeah, we can start there. Sure. Um, so um, we have uh, a full-time on-site independent um, party overseeing the construction work. Um, that could be our internal staff or in very large complex projects, we could procure what's called a construction manager who acts as NYCHA's uh, daily kind of eyes and ears on the site to monitor everything that the contractors are doing in terms of safety, quality of work, and other components. In addition to that daily presence throughout the construction period, we do independent spot checks. We have an independent safety and quality inspection team that selects sites and goes out and does an independent uh, spot check on safety issues. Uh, on any type of um, quality issues. They issue deficiency reports um, to the contractors and we track um, resolution to ensure that those are resolved in a timely manner related to safety or quality. Um, in addition to that, our um, project managers um, uh, also make uh, site visits to the site um, uh, as well as uh, we have field supervisors who are experts in field work who go out from NYCHA directly and inspect what's happening on the construction site, meet with our property staff, with our residents to understand if there's any concerns or issues. Those are the most focused layers of oversight we have of the contractors, and there are additional um, you know, components that we've talked about earlier around other um, uh, independent bodies. Our compliance function plays a role in doing one additional level of oversight of capital work as well. So in terms of um, kind of walk me through how uh, uh, an independent, I guess the, the, the construction manager is gonna, you have a contractor who has a contract of doing work in multiple developments, um, but it doesn't stipulate exactly where the uh, contractor is gonna be on what particular day. How is NYCHA managing to do that? Sure, so even where our contractors may be under a contract to work at multiple developments, which is, I believe, relatively limited in our portfolio, um, they uh, would be assigning a specific team um, to the work at each development who would typically be there full time doing that work. Our construction management teams would also be different teams at each of those sites, typically overseeing that work on a day to day basis, ensuring that whatever staff are there underneath that contractor are following the different policies and procedures we have in place. So the contractor is reporting back to NYCHA on a daily basis where it's going to be spending its its days? Sure, sorry, so I, I didn't answer that part of your question. Um, on a, at least a biweekly basis, um, we have a specific meeting to look at a two-week look-ahead schedule, which is a, a typical in the construction industry, where the contractor has to provide a view on all of the activities in the next two weeks at that site, the staff that will be there, and our construction manager and our teams will scrutinize um, different aspects of that look-ahead to ensure that everything is managed and coordinated well. Um, so we get that visibility more formally on a two-week basis, and that's where we also include the TA leadership and others to get that visibility if they'd like to join those discussions. 
but then on a daily basis, we are then monitoring that they're actually following that schedule and the different things that have been planned and agreed. And in terms of resident engagement, um, where, where are the residents in this process? Sure. So um, as I mentioned a bit earlier, our resident leadership at each site um, is involved um, from the beginning of a project um, in a number of different ways. Um, on a project-specific basis, our project teams will typically do a project kickoff um, with the development staff and the resident leadership. Um, we may be invited to a resident meeting to present about the project and discuss with the broader resident population. Um, throughout the design phase, the majority of projects will include a number of different resident touch points, um, inputting to different aspects of the design, um, the locations, um, the scope, um, and in, in, in certain types of projects, very specific sign-offs from residents. So for example, location of CCTV cameras around the campus and things like that would go through a resident sign-off process before the design is finalized. Um, during the construction phase, I think I highlighted earlier a number of the touch points from the pre-construction meeting, the construction kickoff, and then the uh, invites include the um, resident association leadership in these bi-weekly construction meetings for any sort of visibility that would be helpful for them. Um, we are in the process of, uh, well, in 2021, we revamped our stakeholder engagement approach for capital projects and release that formally, and we're in the process of now reviewing that about what we've learned since then to again revamp um, and provide um, you know, increased resident engagement uh, opportunities wherever we can. So in terms of, um, we get all the feedback from the residents, as, as does NYCHA. Uh, they are the eyes and ears on the ground throughout the developments, and they have quite a lot to say about contractors. and. One of the more repeated instances that I've heard is that NYCHA employees will send them to complain to the contractors. What is the policy around receiving resident feedback? How is it cat um, cataloged? And how does NYCHA incorporate that into its day-to-day -day monitoring and assessment of a contractor? Sure, so in, in general, our procedure is, is not for residents to um, provide that feedback to uh, a contractor uh, directly, um, given potential you know, safety concerns about going into construction area and things like that. The construction manager I mentioned earlier, uh, who is a NYCHA staff or can be a contractor who's playing that day-to-day -day oversight role, is the typical point of contact for residents, for similarly for our own property managers, to raise any issues or concerns and ensure that they're resolved effectively. Um, typically, um, resident uh, concerns or issues um, would be submitted you know, either during these biweekly meetings that we've talked about. Um, we do normally ask our resident leaders to provide them by email so that we can track and ensure there's always good follow-up with the construction managers. Where issues are not resolved on a timely basis, they are typically escalated. Um, by the property managers to our um, central project managers who are also overseeing the projects and the contracts, um, and uh, they will then get more involved and help to um, resolve any type of issues that may be beyond um, you know, the capacity of the construction manager or the property manager or others on site to resolve directly. Um, uh, we also have a um, team who goes out and uh, does regular visits at each site to understand um, challenges or concerns that the, the property staff or the resident leadership feels around any of the capital projects that may be happening there. This is something that we've introduced a few months back and we're now ramping up as another checkpoint to find out um, what type of more um, strategic or other type of issues um, residents are facing that relate to capital work that we could do a better job of dealing with. Um, and we also take uh, resident uh, inquiries via the capital projects tracker that um, I highlighted earlier. We get emails um, that come in from residents. Um, we address them and track them and ensure that they are answered and the issues are resolved if that requires just a written answer or um, a referral to the project team to you know, uh, do something at the site differently or to go have a resident meeting or something like that. How much engagement are you getting through the resident inquiry tracker? Um, I don't have that data at hand, but uh, that's definitely something we can provide to you. I'd also just love to know um, kind of the scale and scope of uh, inquiries you've received from residents, either in the form of complaints or um, happiness with work being done. Councilmember Wong. 
I just want to acknowledge Councilmember Sandy Nurse, Councilmember Linda Lee, and Councilmember um, Rafael Salamanca, who has also joined us. Thank you for joining us. I have a follow-up question about third-party vendors. Can you provide a breakdown of what type of jobs are outsourced to the contractors? Thank you for the question, Council Member. I'll just get that information for you. Because I'm asking what is outsourced to determine how NYCHA figures out when they should hire more third party vendors or hire more NYCHA staff. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Hi, Council Member. I, I can answer that question as it really um, it, it involves a determination of resource allocation. Uh, as you put it, when, when do we hire, when do we contract? And, um, you know, really the, the most efficient is for us to always have a balance of the two. And so, for example, as, as part of our transformation plan efforts in the last few budgets, we have increased NYCHA staffing significantly to support our transformation programs. As I mentioned, work order reform before and decentralizing our skilled trades down to the development level, that required significant staffing. We hired over 450 new skilled trades across the, uh, the city for, for all of our sites over the last year. In addition, we're hiring over about 150 new caretakers to, to perform janitorial work across our sites. And so that's a sig one of the most significant investments in staffing that we've made in the last few years. However, that's, that's not enough. Um, it's what we could afford but budgetarily, but it also, we also still require the use of outside vendors from time to time, depending on emergencies or the severity of situations, or even just to operate most efficiently. So one example I'll provide, and, and so those decisions are made on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, you know, as they are needed by the developments. Um, one example I'll provide is um, plumbers. So uh, based on a city council law passed a few years ago, plumber, uh, gas stoves require a gas license from plumbers to, for installation. Our plumbers are very busy with dealing with you know, major leaks and plumbing issues in our buildings. And so we very often contract out with gas qualified plumbing vendors in order to respond to stove installations in order to allow our, our plumbers to stay focused on leak issues. So that's just one example of how we balance between you know, an outsourcing decision and a staffing decision. Can you tell, um, oh, we are always happy to hear that um, there's an addition of staffing because it is a serious need, particularly on the caretaker. What is the total number of staffing in terms of skilled trades that are, are currently um, uh, part of NYCHA and also caretakers? So what's the total? I'll get back to you with that, okay. that staffing breakdown. What is the total spending for third party contractors by NYCHA this, fiscally, uh, this past fiscal year? We'll have to get back to you in particular that. I mean, as, as I mentioned in the testimony, uh, or excuse me, in the, in the prior question, you know, our contracting budget's approximately $2.1 billion. Um, in okay. regards to some third-party contractors, uh, structural brickwork, electrical plumbing, and in regards and professional services, we're looking at $152.9 mil $152 uh, year-to-date. And are these contracts available for public review? They're on the on the checkbook, on the comptroller's okay. checkbook. Thank you. Has NYCHA conducted a cost benefit anal analysis for a municipality worker versus private contracting labor force? If so, can you share that copy of the report? Uh, uh, NYCHA does not do a, a cost benefit analysis, uh, but it does charge the developments, the AMPs, uh, for skilled trade time on a fee for service basis. And uh, as part of the HUD asset management requirement, um, HUD is, is who determines market reasonableness. And uh, in just last year, we finished that review and we can provide that information to you. Great, um, in terms of, uh, excuse me, um, in terms of poor work, from from contracts, has NYCHA ever recuperated money for poor work for contractors? 
we do submit claims to our law department for either clawbacks or whatnot as, a, as an element of our process. Do you have a sense of what percentage of the contracts NYCHA has pursued for, for in claims? I do not. I, I, we can get back to you with that information. Actually, I was going to, uh, in terms of Queensbridge houses, um, where a contract was issued to replace intercom system, and upon project completions, the residents still don't have a working intercom. Can you talk to us about that? The contract is with Verizon. Um, I'm aware of some of the, the Queensbridge uh, contract issues in regards to, in regards to the intercom. Um, I, I will have to confirm with you about the Verizon interplay there. Um, I was told a different, different vendor name, but we can get back to you to confirm. I know that we are having conversations about how, that we, about how to actually solve that problem mm -hmm. on the intercom and what additional um, uh, hardware that I think we may be needed to, to you know, finish that project um, and bring the intercom to back into service. Who should I be speaking to make, to make sure that this project has been resolved? It's been years now. Uh, we, can, we can speak directly offline and continue okay. that conversation. Thank you. In terms of poor contractors, again, um, how, does, how is the agency verifying whether contractors are barred in other agencies? Uh, did, are you using the same system? And how is that verified? So we, we do subscribe to the passport system um, from a vendor responsibility standpoint. And then we are current, constantly um, uh, evaluating our vendor performance and what have you. We are starting to develop new tools uh, to make that a continuous process, and just not at the point of award, but on an ongoing basis. As I mentioned earlier, the Dun & Bradstreet uh, supplier risk tool and so forth. More of the integration of these tools is going to help us manage our vendors better. So in terms of, um, obviously you have your own system, but you are integrating or able, capable to use Passport. Mm -hmm. Are you ensuring that when you have a poor experience with a contractor, it is making it into Passport and vice versa? Where? And the reason why I ask is because there are, I've talked to um, actually s several laborers who are, uh, who are often mystified that certain contracts are being used at NYCHA when they're not working with other city agencies. And how, how does that slip through the cracks? I can't speak to those particular instances. I, I, I do want to say that working collaboratively with operations, we're trying to create a better feedback loop as it relates to our vendors and ensure that, that those quality issues are addressed uh, contemporaneously with poor performance and either the vendor um, cures accordingly or we need to cancel that contract or claw back anything that's undue. But that feedback loop is very, very important uh, from a procurement standpoint, a contract management standpoint. I definitely like to um, understand the percentage uh, of contracts that are canceled and or that are pursued legally or and or that are um, uh, NYCHA is pursuing clawbacks on. We'll get, we'll get back to you with that data. Thank you. In terms of um, micro-purchase contracts, um, obviously we, we understand that these are contracts that hopefully are afforded more flexibility so they can move through the system and get the work uh, moving quick more quickly. Uh, how is the vet vetting process for these done, given uh, the number of people that, that manage those? So vendors at that level uh, do not go through a passport check. Um, we're addressing those issues now. Uh, part of the, the purpose of putting Dun & Bradstreet in place is to start to evaluate these vendors on a pre-qualifications basis. And we will be looking over the course of the next year of doing a PQL uh, for all vendors doing business with NYCHA so that we at least do um, an initial review of these vendors and we know who they are. That's first and foremost. Also as it relates to micros, and as you can see in our trend of spend, we're trying to reduce the number of micros 
that are done at the operations level. Um, it's important for operations to be able to focus in on meeting the needs of the residents as opposed to doing an administrative function that should be done by procurement and purchasing. Um, in order to meet that, that goal of ours, uh, what's important is to create a robust uh, portfolio of contracts where uh, the needs of the developments are clearly uh, crosswalked to the providers of resources and services in order to meet those needs. The gaps now are great to the point that then developments are required to do micro purchases. So uh, we have seen uh, a decrease of over 50% of the use of micro purchases in the last year that we've gone to more of this model, um, but there's still much work to do. And is, is um, our developments given specific allotments around uh, micro purchasing? They're provided a threshold. Developments are allowed a threshold of up to 5,000 at the development level for micro purchases. Uh, purchase, micro purchases up to 10,000 then are required to be approved um, by the, I believe, borough, borough VP and by procurement but up to 5,000 are provided level of discretion. That's the contract value, but is there a threshold in terms of um, Red Hook Houses has a, a threshold of $100,000 in micro contracts? Across the, the enterprise, across all developments. So it's, it's 5,000 per development for micro contracts. I'm sorry if I'm misunderstanding. Per contract, per, per order. So Red Hook Houses has an allotment of $5,000. Do you want me to jump in and clarify? Yeah, sorry. I'm sorry. I think, I think what you're asking, so what Sergio is responding to is the threshold for a micro purchase is 5000 The individual d budget of the development is set by um, finance b based on HUD rules, as, as Sergio mentioned before, through the asset management program of what the development um, can, what, what the development budget is based on their, their rent collection and, and their um, units. So it depends on, on the budget of the development, how much they can they decide to spend for micro purchases versus larger purchases versus equipment, supplies, other things. The development works that out with finance. So it's a budgeting question. So where would we find that information around what are those, I guess, estimates per development? I, I will discuss with finance and get back to you about, um, about the budgets for the individual developments. Great. Part of the question is trying to figure out how it relates, obviously, to the actual needs. We have a PNA that seems to be a, a nice estimation, but certainly doesn't capture true needs. So we're trying to figure out how, how are these allocations distributed across a portfolio in serious need. Absolutely, and so the individual development budgets are you know, negotiated with, with finance, um, and, and again, they're also, you know, negotiated mid-year as, as things come up if there are additional needs that, that need to be made. So, you know, for example, if there's a fire and the development needs additional funding for cleaning, uh, you know, in order to respond to that fire, things like that, you know, finance works with the development in order to modify budgets in order to make funding available for them to then bring in a vendor to, to clean up after a fire. Great, so I, I would love to see how, what determinations have been made for the developments across the portfolio. Thank you. Um, I'd like to acknowledge Council Member Salamanca. Thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Madam, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, good, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for being here in this hearing today. I, uh, I represent the South Bronx. I have about 19 NYCHA developments. And in my last numbers, I think to fix all of my NYCHA capital needs, uh, a few years back, we were at $800 million just for my council district alone. Um, I've allocated funding to NYCHA. NYCHA has taken forever to get things done. I've actually recommended to my colleagues not to give NYCHA any capital dollars until you guys get your act together. Uh, I'm gonna be leaving office in three and a half years and some projects that I fund that are still in procurement process. So I would like to know if you can give me an understanding of what entails, uh, if you can break down the procurement process, why does the procurement take so long uh, to be completed? If you can just give me a quick 30 seconds, exactly what is procurement for NYCHA? In regards to capital, in regards just generally speaking? In regards to capital. Sure, uh, thank you, Councilmember Salamanca. 
Um, basically, at the end of the design phase for a typical project, we will create a bid document that goes out for the procurement. Um, that bid document um, has to go through a number of steps to be publicly released and available for contractors to bid. The way our system is set up, uh, once contractors bid, we get those bids in. If they're found to be responsive, they've met all the documentation requirements and other aspects. Well, we typically, as was discussed earlier, um, in most of the project cases are mandated to select the lowest bid and then to award to that contractor. Um, in our documentation, when we talk about the procurement phase, um, there's a number of additional steps that happen after we select um, the uh, lowest cost or, or, or um, preferred contractor, um, depending on the size of the contract that may have to go through a board approval. Um, at the same time, there would be the vendor responsibility check done by DOI um, that my colleague referred to, and a number of processes till we can get to the point of actually executing the contract. Where it is a city-funded contract, we have the additional steps that come in around the submissions to OMB for the OMB approval, and then uh, subsequent to receiving the certificate to proceed, we submit to the comptroller for comptroller registration. So once all of that is done, we consider that the end of the procurement phase and move to construction. What, what's the time frame for, for this process? Do you guys have a set time frame? Just like in Lanyuls, when we do a ULERP, there's, it goes through different phases, but community board has 50 days, borough president 50 days. What's your time frame? Sure. Um, yes, we have uh, detailed time frames for each of those steps. The, um, the major point of the procurement, the bid package to receiving the bids and selecting is typically, given the size of our projects, you know, 90 to 120 days, but can vary if they're much smaller or much larger. Um, and then the, um, uh, the processes around vendor responsibility, vendor name check, um, the board approval and all of that typically takes um, another three to four months, so 90 to 120 days. And um, as where it's a city-funded project that requires city approvals, um, the process that we uh, go through preparing packages, submitting, iterating with um, city agencies and getting through the approval process um, during the construction procurement um, can take anywhere from um, three to six months. Um, so altogether, we typically budget um, about a year for that procurement phase. So one year just for procurement, all right? Let's keep that in mind. Uh, talk to me about your design phase. How long, how, if you can give me a breakdown, how does that work? Sure, the design phase can vary significantly based on the scope of work. Um, we budget um, in you know, some small projects four months for design. Um, in uh, larger projects, um, typically our standard is uh, a 12-month design phase. And in extremely large projects, um, it can extend beyond that or extremely complex projects. The design phase is structured um, like any other capital um, entity in the industry with a set number of design milestones around um, you know, conceptual design, 25% design, 50% design up through construction documents, and then the final design documents um, and any type of approvals and things that are required. So how long does a design phase take? You say about a year? Yeah, our standard uh, baseline without knowing the scope would be to assume about a year. Right. So one year design phase, one year procurement phase. So that's two years in to get things done. Uh, does NYCHA plan on consolidating this process to make it much faster? Yeah, we have a number of efforts underway to streamline where we can. Um, I would say that those one year uh, design and procurement phases from what we've seen talking to other city agencies are relatively standard, if not at the lower end. How many designers do you have on staff? Um, our um, architecture and engineering services function um, that I oversee, um, uh, we can get back with, to you on exact numbers, but um, has uh, between uh, 50 and 60 engineers and architects. You have about 50 and 60 engineers and architects. Madam Chair, may I ask one more question? Uh, my, I know my time expired. A um, few years back, so one of my NYCHA developments that I'm keeping a close eye on is the Stebbins-Hewitt Consolidated. Um, a few years back, uh, the previous speaker, I was going to allocate some funding uh, to, to cover the, the issues that they have in Hewitt and Stebbins is um, the heating, the boilers, and I know that uh, it, that work was done, uh, but the windows, the air, the draft coming in and out. I wanted to allocate funding, and NYCHA said, council member, allocate that funding elsewhere. We're planning on adding uh, uh, Stebbins-Hewitt to the RAD program. Um, I said, okay. 
Uh, moving forward, uh, now it's, it seems that this development is part of what's called the Pact Round 10. Am I, am I saying that correctly? Um, we had a major meeting last year uh, with NYCHA and my tenants, about 125 units that were frozen, air coming in and out of the windows. Um, and NYCHA said, well, now it's going to be part of the uh, PAC Round 10. This work will be done. It's estimated anywhere between $3 million to $3.2 million. Winter's coming, and the work still has not been done. Can you give me a time frame as to what can I tell my constituents now that they're going to suffer another, you know, cold winter in their apartments? Uh, sure. I think we can come back to you on the exact dates for the closing and the construction process um, for that PAC conversion, um, you know, later today uh, or along with our other responses from this hearing. Okay. I look forward to hearing from NYCHA uh, on this. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, council member. Um, I'd like to go back to the micro, micro contracts, um, if you will. Uh, in terms of, given the flexibility, again, and obviously there's no procurement process, but w what is the expectation in terms of, of how those um, contracts are um, evaluated? And where are those evaluations held? The evaluations are held at the programmatic level. Um, you know, again, as I mentioned before, we're trying to reduce the number of micro purchases that are done at that level because that's not their particular expertise. We're also going through, again, the uh, process for uh, determining what the needs are for the coming year, at which point then we'll identify those gaps and also crosswalking those needs to those particular resources in the, in the developments. Our hope is to always, you know, to really in the end, uh, you know, hang a sign on the supervisor's door that says no more solicitation, because that's really the, the issue here. There are folks that just don't really understand the way to manage these sorts of contracts, so. No, I, I appreciate that it has decreased significantly and you're, you're developing a, a better tracking mechanism. Um, and it is a place that we have seen a good, good amount of corruption occurring in um, and was wondering, I guess amidst these changes, how, how NYCHA is keeping an eye on um, that possibility, like what mechanisms have been put in place uh, to, to ensure that this is not a place, uh, a gap. Forecasting is key to that. Mm -hmm. In terms of, I guess, shifting a little bit onto labor, um, in t how does NYCHA verify wages that are being paid on a contract? Sure. Um, so uh, in terms of our, our capital contracts, um, historically what we've done is that with the monthly or regular invoice submission, one of the roles that our project managers play in addition to what um, our chief procurement officer explained earlier around section three compliance reviews is also looking at um, prevailing wage compliance uh, with that invoice review. So with the certified payrolls and the other information we receive before we sign off an invoice processing uh, request, we are, our staff have to review all of that. We've recently implemented an automated system that's um, used throughout the country by government agencies um, to do that prevailing wage um, assessment and compliance review um, in a more um, automated, structured way to ensure that um, we, know we have very standardized uh, process and timelines to do those reviews. But all of our um, invoices from contractors go through that process today. So the automation is currently fully implemented? Yes, so we, um, we had piloted it earlier this year on the capital project side. We've rolled it out to all vendors um, several months back and we're currently uh, piloting the same software on the uh, operations contracts um, to be rolled out across the portfolio uh, later this year. So in terms of, um, has, has NYCHA received any particular specific complaints about wage theft and, and the payment of prevailing wage on any pro projects? We do, uh, we do provide a toll-free number uh, for employees to re uh, report wage theft. Um, as of, um, for the period between 2019 and 2021, uh, we've had a total of 18 complaints. I'm sorry, say that one more time. We've had a total of 18 complaints of wage theft. 
and walk me through what happens with those 18 complaints. Um, I apologize, I can't speak to that. Uh, can you walk me through what happens? You receive a complaint, what happens next? Do you want me to take a stab at it? Yeah, please. Yeah, so we have a uh, independent quality assurance function. Um, within that function, there is a team that's specialized in prevailing wage compliance. Um, when a complaint is made, for example, in my area of capital, it's referred to that independent uh, investigation function. They then meet with the um, claimant who's made the claim. They investigate the, um, you know, the contract, the contractor from their perspective, and then make a determination if there's been any sort of wage theft. How large, how large is the team? You walked me th through um, certainly you know, the oversight with construction manager and the independent spot checks, um, quality assurance function. How, how large are all of these units? Um, I, I'm probably conflating all of them in a way that doesn't make any sense at all, but I'd love to understand how it's organized and, and how much uh, human power we're talking about. So we can get back to you on the size of the quality assurance department. Um, that that's something that's in house. I think some of the construction management teams that um, Sean was referring to are fluid, as they're part of the outside vendor contracts. So I, I can add to that, um, as, as Eva mentioned, on the quality assurance function, which sits outside of my areas for its independence. Um, we can get back to you on the numbers of the team um, in terms of. Um, how many staff we have working on capital projects. So um, we can get back to you with exact numbers. I oversee both our capital projects work and our real estate development work. So when I normally think about um, the staff that I oversee, I'm combining those in my mind. But basically, um, we have um, uh, somewhere between, um, you know, around 350 um, headcount um, who are focused on our capital work specifically. Got it. If, if you're combining them, you can only imagine the football that is happening in my brain uh, around the organization. In terms of this past April, uh, New York Attorney General Tish James and the DOI Commissioner Strauber announced that Lintech, an entity contracted by NYCHA, would be restoring nearly one million in lost wages to workers who would not pay the prevailing wage. Um, I understand that now Lintech will be banned from New York Public Works projects for a period of five years. This threshold seems awfully low uh, to me for wage theft. What else, if anything, will Lintech have to demonstrate in order to be considered again for public works? Council member, we'll have to look into that. I mean, obviously, through the uh, responsibility and process, there's a caution now you know, onto their name and as an entity and those that lead that organization. So we'll work with our DOI partners and whatnot to determine whether or not they can do business in New York. Okay, I look forward to receiving that information. Um, in terms, how many civil service workers does NYCHA have? And you'll get back to me and can you, <laughs> Can you? I mean, our, our staffing is, is, I think, somewhere between 11 or 12,000 employees, but we'll get back to you with the exact amount and, um, and the civil service status of that. Great. And if this number can be broken down by division, yes, that would be helpful. Um, lastly, um, in terms of MWBEs, uh, can you speak to us about uh, how many NWBs were hired fiscal 19, 20, and 21? I can speak to the number of contracts that were awarded and the dollar amounts, if that's what you mean. Um, in the years of, uh, of 2019, excuse me, 2021, I've got it, I've got it so broken down that uh, I can go by micros and then smalls okay. and large, if that's okay. okay. That's okay. So micros in 2019, we had an 8,936 with a total sum of $30 million. In 2020 for micros, 5,748 purchase orders for a total of 18.3 million. In 2021, 4,238 with a total of 16.2 million. Can I ask you to repeat that one more time? Sure, 
I wish, I wish there would, it, it, can you hold for just one second? Because I probably sure. have it more in a summary format and it might be easier for me to, to share with you. I apologize. So I am going to have to provide you this information by each of those details. I apologize. And then I will follow up with, uh, with a summary format. Again, and uh, I'll go with large first because that's really the corpus of our spend. And I would say within the last three years, uh, we've had a total of $820 million awarded to MWBEs. We're second on the, um, on the report, the one on YC, uh, second only to school, school construction authority for MWBE spend. Um, in addition to that, our total spend of that $820 million is comprises 17% of, of our spend over the last three years. Um, and what are the goals? So what? now we have a, um, before our goals were aspirational, now it's, it, now it, it's, it's a, a documented goal of 30%, 15% female and 15% um, minority. And what are the specific um, uh, tactics that NYCHA will be using to, to meet this goal? So the biggest thing is, is really looking again at what our forecast is going to be for the current year. Uh, we're also going to be, uh, as I mentioned before, pre-qualifying our vendors. And through that PQL process, we'll be able to identify uh, diversity pools that we can then target depending upon the particular spend and really be driving to that diversity with a, a good corpus of understanding where our spend is going to go, at that point then we can better manage how to go to, how to solicit and target uh, based on our policies. Uh, MWB, and, and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Section 3 as well. And is this a goal for the fiscal year or is this over a certain period of time? That goal is on a per contract basis. Um, as we continue to develop the compliance tools, um, external to our vendors. We'll also start to develop compliance tools within the agency where these goals then start to uh, break down into the programmatic level so each of our senior leaders would understand what their budgets are and then what their uh, diversity goals are in regards to their budgets. That's a, a long-term proposition. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I wanna just check in and make sure. Um, th thank you for uh, being so flexible in all our questions and how we move around. Um, in terms of uh, public uh, advocate Jamani Williams recently released a report, How the Other Half Lives, and among his recommendations were requesting that OMB allow NYCHA to utilize the job order contract for certain capital eligible, recommend, um, capital eligible contracts. Um, what is what is NYCHA's view of this proposal? I'm not familiar with the details of the specific proposal. Um, we do currently use um, job order contracting um, out of our federal funding for certain types of work where that's a very effective model uh, of public procurement. Do you use it for state or local funding of capital, state or local funded capital projects? I would need to just confirm that uh, and come back to you. I would suspect that the public advocate is talking about that in, in particular. So given that we have found those contracts to be useful in certain types of work in certain contexts um, and to be cost effective utilizing federal funding, um, you know, I think that that flexibility would provide us another uh, tool in the toolbox um, if available for other funding sources. Is, um, is, is local funding um, more complex to deploy in terms of the capital process? Like is the procurement and implementation of it more challenging than the federal funding? 
Yeah, there are mainly two areas where it adds complexity. We've talked already about the additional approvals that are required and okay. the processes and procedures around those. As part of that process, there is a capital eligibility assessment um, that um, uh, you know, can restrict where capital funds can be used. And in general, that is more restrictive than what is required at a federal uh, or state level. Great. Well, we would be supportive of anything that's going to help us move these capital projects forward, and particularly the spending at the city and, and state-funded state projects, which we know is um, pretty appalling. Um, in terms of, uh, excuse me one quick second, Gail, um, I will turn it over to Council Member Burr. Just a quick question, and I don't know the answer at all. So one of the challenges, not your fault, is that you have a federal emergency voucher, and I don't remember, 17 or 14 percent of them are used because it's hard for many reasons to get the owners to take those vouchers. Without getting into that, is it all in-house that is the effort to make possible these vouchers for New Yorkers, or is there an outside company that's helping to do that? Because one of our biggest challenges right now is getting these vouchers used with federal money sitting in a pot, and if you look at a spreadsheet, it says, oh my goodness, we haven't spent all this federal money, but it's because we can't use the vouchers. Is that something that is all in-house, or is there a contract associated with trying to figure this problem out? I don't know the answer, and I don't know what the right answer is, but I do know we have a problem. Um, I will confirm with our leased housing division. I believe they are managing directly the uh, allocation of the emergency housing vouchers. I know that they have added staff in order to, um, to handle that program, but I'm not sure if they've also brought on any organizations to help with the, with the resident search and outreach, but we will confirm and get back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Brewer. So, so I think that We'll wrap up um, our line of questions. Obviously, we will have a hearing this Friday that will dive again into contracts and problems around contracting and particular vendors, but we'll, we'll specifically talk about that then. I'm a little surprised that you weren't prepared to answer any of those questions today or didn't anticipate that it would actually come up. Um, that is unfortunately disappointing. However, we will have an opportunity to talk about it at length. Um, so I would like to thank the panel, and I guess we can turn it over to public testimony. Is that? Thank you very much. Uh, at this time, we'll turn to testimony from the public. Uh, we are um, who are joining both in person and via Zoom. We will hear from Joshua Barnett, who is joining on Zoom. Your time will begin. Joshua Barnett, you may begin when ready. Okay. Oh, hi, sorry, I was having trouble with, um, with the link. Um, thanks everybody and thanks for holding this hearing. Really appreciate it, it's a vital issue. Um, I also sent in written testimony. My name is Josh Barnett and I'm a member of Local 375, DC 37 AFSCME. I'm a member of the NYCHA Union Coalition and I'm president of Chapter 25, Local 375 at NYCHA. I've also worked um, for the New York City Housing Authority as an architect in the design department, now called Architecture and Engineering Services since 1999. I also formerly worked for the Boston Housing Authority. 
Um, and this issue really does hit home because what was described earlier really doesn't describe the day-to-day -day process of trying to get a contract out to provide services for the residents. Well, what we deal with every day is in, is in awarding processing contracts is a continuing growth of outsourcing, privatization, really top-heavy management, and an increasingly confusing and changing bureaucracy to the detriment of the residents and taxpayers. While the main issue NYCHA faces and public housing grapples with is chronic underfunding at all levels of government, NYCHA management's ongoing mismanagement of contracts continually makes the worst of a bad situation and we're the ones who really pay for it. We talked before about what's the breakdown between outsourced contracts and at NYCHA's presentation on the fiscal plan for 2022 through 2023, what was striking about that plan the other week, um, as always, was not what was in the plan, but what wasn't in the plan. There was, as always, no breakdown specifically in spending allocation between what work and design and construction oversight or anything else is performed by in-house staff versus what is spent on consultants. And there's nothing by way, as was admitted before, of a cost-benefit analysis of keeping work in-house. No breakout of how many consultants or staff augmenters are on the payroll. And it's nothing new. NYCHA, there, there has been some hiring recently, but when I started at NYCHA in 1999, there were almost 16,000 employees, we're about 12,000. Now the technical staff, architects, engineers, construction managers like myself, there were 450, we're at 250. Now you can imagine the effects that has on trying to get capital projects actually executed. In 2004, NYCHA introduced the CM Build Construction Management Build Program to outsource construction management services with the stated goal of increasing on time and on budget performance. The program is still in place, but 18 years later, there still has no been full documentation or forensic audit on the CM's performance. And this is actually not getting better, it's going to get worse because as part of the trust, there are, quote, alternative methods of contract procurement like design build, but those further bypass the competitive bid process and minimize public oversight. NYCHA is increasingly relying in capital projects on what are called jock contracts, job order contracts, where the contract is awarded directly to a contractor without specifications, bypassing the bid process is one of the reasons why we see continuing contractors who don't perform often um, continue to get work because consultant evaluation and contractor evaluation is a minimal part of the award process and the review process. Um, in the NYCHA facility at Long Island City, on both the third and the fourth floors, it is literally impossible to tell who is on the NYCHA payroll and who is a consultant, except by looking at the color of their ID badge. There's a number of consultants called staff augmenters here who duplicate the work of public, of public workers um, using NYCHA resources, NYCHA computers, working on NYCHA projects. Um, but they have, but they're paid as a multiplier of 2.2, meaning that they cost more than what a union worker would do and have less experience. And they're on the, and it's not they're, not, they're not just filling in a gap. A lot of these people are here literally for years, and that's ongoing. And again, we have yet to see an assessment. It's also a violation of the union's collective bargaining agreement to do that because the contract requires a cost benefit analysis, which has never been provided. And we think it's also a violation of civil service regulations. And since the, the dire need for repairs is ongoing, you would think that these people would be on payroll, but instead they're put on contract. Um, and for, and at, as part of the whole blueprint and transformation plan, we see all of this talk about stakeholder engagement and trying to be data driven, which are fine in the abstract, but when the rubber meets the road, we really don't see that put into practice. What we do see a lot of hiring of is more managers. I was at a resident meeting where one resident said that she thought the NYCHA was so top heavy, she was surprised it didn't topple over. We have so many people monitoring the work as instead of producing the work that again, it really doesn't help us get out the work that we need to the residents. And when it came out of city council hearing a few weeks ago, a couple months ago, that, less, that, that more than 90% of capital funds are not expended on 
balance on projects, that really wasn't a surprise. We deal with a really convoluted process of trying to get out contracts. We wrestle with a program called eBuilder that nobody really understands. Even getting out of the small task order to try and get hazardous material testing, which you think would be the simplest process because it's so vital, takes weeks at a minimum. Um, and what we're seeing in terms, again, the balance between in-house versus outsourcing is that the projects that are kept in-house are mostly the city cap funded projects and they're vital, but the larger projects are sent out to consultants who have less, who have less institutional knowledge about how to design for public housing. And you know, and the fact that RAD and PACT are in place and the trust are in place are a ways of avoiding having to deal with the systemic issues for those developments who are not in RAD and PACT, where I think there should be a moratorium anyway. Um, and you know, and again, as somebody alluded to before, the net effect of all of this is not doesn't address the main problem, which is the dire need to address the forty-five billion dollar backlog in capital repairs. But it's the reputation that NYCHA has in terms of trying to get additional funding for public housing. So many people at all levels of political government, residents, even workers, say, why should NYCHA get more money when they can't even handle the money that they have now? And when you have that kind of reputation, it really serves to the detriment of public housing, which needs to be expanded, not just repaired. Um, so what we really think that we need from the union point of view is upstaffing, really complying with section three, more resident hiring. There are so many residents ready, willing, and able to do the work on their own developments that uh, we need a forensic audit, open audit as to outsourcing and privatization. NYCHA really needs to comply with the city regulations requiring a cost benefit analysis when public um, services are outsourced to private, we can't buy into the myth that the only solution for this is privatization, either red pact or the trust or going to design build or relying on the private sector. Because for them, the bottom line is the bottom line. This is the last stock of affordable housing in the city. We need to have open books, transparency, real stakeholder involvement, and make sure that public housing stays public and the money is spent efficiently, because that's the way to guarantee ongoing funding for this for, for vital service like this. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Barnett. Um, I have a quick follow-up question. I, I appreciate um, all that you provided in your testimony. Um, this, is, this is actually uh, slightly tangentially in terms of the, um, the, the telework policy. Has the, has the telework policy differential been uh, remedied or does it continue to exclude um, workers, except for management. Did he leave? Oh, oh I'm sorry, I was, I was muted for a second. No, that has, I'm glad you raised that point, but I didn't think it was specifically related to contracts, but no, it hasn't been remedied. Um, a year ago, July, NYCHA initiated a policy of announcing that managers, but only managers would be allowed to work remotely three days a week, um, but that was not given to the non-managerial staff, and that policy is still very much in place. The last I heard, NYCHA was offering one day a week, and the union was considering that, but no, like all city workers, we've been forced back to the city with no, telework not being an option. Um, and that, like all other agencies, that's having a detrimental effect on the ability to upstaff because people have options to go to places where they can telework. But no, that kind of disparate policy between granting that privilege and safety to managers and not to union staff is still very much in place. And nobody really understands the rationale for that. We haven't heard one to date. Thank you, Mr. Barnett. We will be following up with NYCHA and also um, the unions around the discrepancy of um, the policy. Thank you. Thank you. I guess with that, um, our hearing will conclude. Thank you so much.